to Corner to Corner Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, my name is Jeff, and I'm joined, as always, by my other host, whose name is... Paul! Yes, that's oh, me! Well Hello! <laughs> yeah. on, on cue, well done. Yeah, it's only taken us two years to get this <laughs> so slick. <laughs> God, the, the edits to make that work are uh, yeah. not painful for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, we're joined by a guest today, um, who's a, a gentleman whose contribution and involvement to the world of Doctor Who uh, has been long and expansive and has touched uh, many aspects of the things that we've seen and watched and read uh, and enjoyed over the years and um, today we're going to find out a little bit more about him um, and his involvement so I'd like to say hello to Mr Edward Russell. Good morning thank you for having me. Well thank you for joining us how are you welcome it's good to see you. Yeah I'm very good thank you I'm I'm enjoying some time off work at the moment which as a freelancer is is kind of happens every now and then you're sort sort (laughs) of half scared but also yep. enjoy the time off, so it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can relate to that. Yeah, we, yes. we both, we're both in that position, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are, yeah. yeah. Good, 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 good. So, um, Edward, you've got a, a very long history with, with Doctor Who, as, as we just mentioned, um, but for anyone who, who doesn't know you and, and what you do, why don't you uh, give us a potted history of, of yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of my work on Doctor Who, I, I started... Um, on Doctor Who in, with David Tennant's second series. Yeah. Uh, and basically I was brought on board um, that first series with Christopher Eccleston, as mm. you know, was a huge success. Mm. And there'd been some activity around it. Um, I don't want to just say merchandise because that restricts it to just the commercial side of it. Yeah. There's all, all the other stuff, all the BBC stuff, all the public service stuff as well, um, was really, you know, hotting up, etc. Um, and there were lots of stakeholders wanting to sort of have access to the production team. And so I was brought mm. on board to join someone else who was already there to sort of be the, the, the link, as it were, between, if you want to call it Russell, Julian, Phil, who were running the show at the time, and then all the other people around them, um, sort of like a, a buffer, a barrier, et cetera. Um, yeah. I think my job title at the time was brand executive or something like that, but I eventually right. became known as brand manager. So I did that for, um, oh gosh, how many years? Was it about 12 years, 14 years? I did it until 2017, right. so yeah, that's that's 14 years. Um, and basically, the job evolved. I became the brand manager, and basically, what you are there is the bit like I was explaining. But you're kind of like a conductor of an orchestra. So you've got all the bits doing all the different areas: the magazines, the books, the toys, um, then all the com- the public service stuff like the website, um, the proms, mm. all that kind of stuff. But then you know, wider and, and things like marketing and press and photos. And even sales of, of, of the show abroad, all, the, all those are done by various people. But you need that one person to sort of be the, the conductor that sort of um, brings them all together and brings them all in time and make sure that they're um, all operating in the same way. Because if you think about it, a PR part of the BBC is also doing PR for all the other dramas and all, you know, yeah. EastEnders, mm-hmm. everything else. So you need someone who's giving the Doctor Who perspective. Um, so that was my job, and I did that, um, as I said, from the start of uh, David Tennant's era, right to the end of Peter Cabaldi's era. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, was, that saw me off at the end of 2017. I did do a lot of conventions after that. I sort of um, did you? made the most of that, that and, and, and sort of flew around the world, or was flown around the world for a bit. And then I think with the combination of wanting to move on a bit and COVID, I sort of stepped away from Doctor Who a little bit. Um, right. And, to be honest with you, uh, you're kind of my first uh, foray back into the world of Doctor Who, other oh, than this. Oh, wow. Now, ah. so. <laughs> so, yes. We are, we are delighted and honoured to, to have yeah, you yeah. <laughs> jump back in well, with us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure it will. Um, so, Edward, we'll come back to your work uh, shortly. I was going to say... Um, you, you make it, um, I think you've downplayed it all a little bit there and, and your involvement with everything. You've made it sound, you know, quite casual, you know, I was do this and, you know, but your involvement <laughs> was, you know, gigantic really. And, and I, I will find out more about it, but the, you know, like you said, being that conductor and, and fielding all of that stuff and all the things mm-hmm. you've been involved in is, is quite staggering really, you know, to, to think about it. So, um, yeah, look, looking forward yeah, to finding I mean, out I, a bit more about I, it all. I suppose I'm slightly deliberately downplaying it because, um, you know, the people that did those things are the people who should get all the glory. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to sort of say, oh, no, it was all me. Even though there probably are lots of things that, you know, I had a direct influence on, <laughs> including there's one very significant thing, which I'm sure we'll come to, that I had a direct influence on on the show itself. 
Um, but but you know, I think uh, it, it depends really. If you're if you're a really hardcore fan, perhaps like I was growing mm. up, who cared about certain things, then I'm pretty sure that I would have had quite a major influence on something that you've enjoyed over the last twenty or so years. Of Doctor yes, Who, so. I, I, I think so. so. Yeah, Definitely. you know, we mm. we know your your name, and you know, we you know, you're you're quite well known within the the world. I think for you know, for everything you've done. So um, that's, that's, it's almost like we scripted this bit because my next question is, uh, tell us how you discovered Doctor Who as, as, and became a fan. Well, as you get older, your early memories disappear a bit, don't you? So it's almost my earliest memory now. I'm sure if you'd asked me... <laughs> oh, mine are totally sure gone, me, yeah. <laughs> if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I would have had another early memory, but I've got a very strong uh, recollection of watching Planet of the Spiders, obviously John Pertwee's last story. And... Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm not sure that was my first Doctor Who because there's been moments over the years mm. uh, where I've perhaps watched other John Pertwee stories and there's been a, something very familiar about them. And of course, you know, growing up as a fan, you see pictures and stuff like that. But I, I, I definitely feel I might have seen it earlier than that. But that's the, the first time I was really like, oh, this is great. And I think I loved it because there were people appearing and disappearing. Uh, there were sort of you know, alien worlds and all that kind of stuff. I loved Sarah Jane. I loved the character of mm. Tommy, which I really identified with as well. And then yeah, you know, yeah. this character, the Doctor, suddenly changed as well. And I, I can definitely remember conversations with my mum or my dad. I can't remember which one. Uh, who <laughs> said, "Oh yeah, there's been lots of Doctors before. You know, this isn't the you know this isn't the first one." And so for me, I would have been about four at the time. Um, that, that's quite mm. switched on with me to have already understood that this was a TV program, etc. Um, I must have been quite bright about stuff like that. I don't know, but um, yeah. So, 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 and you'll know this, I'm sure. Perhaps it happened to you, but as soon as I was hooked, I was fully hooked. And yeah, uh, yeah. within a couple of years, I was watching it religiously, and I stuck with it. Then, you know, even even my teenage years coincided with the sort of perhaps lapse during the 80s where the show was not mm. as popular as it could be. I think we've all reevaluated those eras. Um, or that era, but certainly, you know, I was 16 at the time that Child of the Time Lord was going out. So uh, yeah. at the point where I was probably embarrassed to mention to friends that I watched Doctor Who, Doctor Who wasn't something you <laughs> want to mention that you don't walk, watch it anyway. It wasn't, was it? Yeah, uh, no, I remember. And, you know, <laughs> a anybody a bit younger or who didn't live through that period going, oh, what's he talking about? That's a great uh, period of Doctor Who. I mean, we can look back and we can see that now that mm. it's got a lot going yeah. for it. But at the time just because of everything else that was going on. It was kind of uncool. So I, I sort of stood away from it. And then, you know, the, the show ended. Uh, but I got to know other people who were fans and uh, started to have a lot of nostalgia for the old appearance. I'd carried mm. on buying Doctor Who magazine throughout all this time. Um, of course, the TV movie came in the mid-90s. I was 26. Mm. And so there was a bit of a, you know, feel for it again. And by the end of the yeah. 90s, I was quite... Um, part of a friendship um, uh, group and sort of the early 2000s, which included people like Gary Gillett and Clayton Hickman um, and, and people going to the tavern. So although I wasn't mm. massively involved in Doctor Who or hardcore Doctor Who, I wasn't at all involved in Doctor Who or a hardcore Doctor Who fan like these people, I was part of, of on the periphery oh, that of, circle. of that network. Yeah. So I've kind mm. of been across fandom in various ways uh, for a very long time. But, you know, ultimately, it, it's that thing that I'm sure a lot of people can identify with. It was a thing that I was obsessed with in childhood. And not just the program itself, sort of how it was made as well, but everything around it. Um, and that's probably formed who I am as well today. I've just realised I've talked non-stop and not let you had a word in edgeways. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fine. We're, we're just <laughs> listening. It's, it's always interesting finding out how people uh, discovered the show and, you know, their, their history and their, their journey with it and stuff. So um, uh, that's brilliant. So um, have you got a favourite episode that, that you go back to, you know, a, a comfort one that you could recite line for line? <laughs> Interesting. I mean, if we're going to talk about <laughs> what we what we call the classic era, uh, as it were, um, I mean, it would definitely be Let's something start with like that. Yeah. yeah, that first couple of uh, series of Tom Baker, because that's the point where I really sort of loved it. And, you know, I mean, anything from, uh, from uh, Tom's first three series would be, uh, perfect, but I think I've got a particular fondness for Ark in Space, Terror of the Zygons, mm. Reign of Morbius, um, and Talons Wang Chang, and, and Robots of, of Death as well. I just think they are absolute perfection. Um, 
I'm kind of aware of how um, a, such a great so story as Talons of Wang Chang has um, recently become less than appropriate to watch, and I completely get that. And it's kind of um, mm. so it's a bit like loving songs by Phil Spector or songs by the Smiths. You have to put that in a box and go. I'm I'm going to love yeah. that for what that is, and uh, you know, and, and and but but respect that box that it's in. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, all those it's songs, a product of its great. time. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so tell us a little bit about your career path um, and career that you had, you know, when you started working and, and how it led you to Doctor Who. Well, kind of lucky, really. I'm, I'm somebody who, um, how can I put this without, oh, I'm not particularly, uh, I'm not particularly well educated. I, I left school at 16 because that's kind of what was expected of me and I didn't go to university. But I'm slightly annoyed by that because I'm probably quite bright. So it's a bit of a shame that I wasn't mm. encouraged to do something a bit more. Of my life. Mm. I think that's a generational thing. Um, and so I sort of just went off and worked for an insurance company and, and did what was expected mm. of me. But uh, there was a part of me, certainly by the mid 20s, that wanted to follow uh, the sort of desire I had to work in entertainment. I ended up working for a record company uh, in oh, yeah. London, which was great. Mm. Um, and that was in the heart of. Um, or during the, the heat, rather, of Britpop. So I was yeah, working yeah, for yeah. a record label that included people like uh, Charlatans, um, oh. was associated with people like St. Etienne and all those kind of bands. Yeah, and things yeah. like the Prodigy as well. So that was that was really, really good fun to be part of that. Yeah. And then, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, um, all the Madonna features, and I'm sure we'll come back to her at some point because she still features <laughs> at various points of my life, I ended up working uh, for Top of the Pops. Uh, oh, and this really? is the year of 2000, yes. And this yeah. is the first time that having, you know, I was like, this is something I grew up with that I loved. And what I was working on was the website. Um, and this is back in the times when websites were really a fundamental yeah. part of the thing. Um, mm. And, you know, they would have things on the show like, right, go and um, vote for your favorite song on our website, that kind of stuff. Um, it kind of didn't work at the time because people often would have to go to another room to do that. Now, of course, we've all got yeah. our phones in front of us. It's yeah, very yeah exactly. Very yeah, yeah. But we built up the Top of the Pops website and the Top of the Pops 2 website, and they were kind of became uh, music magazines, a bit like the Top of the Pops magazine, which was really big as well. Yeah. And we sort of looked at things like smash hits um, as, as our, our goal of, of what we wanted to achieve. We had interviews. Gosh, stuff. I remember that. Yeah, um, I used to just go buy smash hits every Thursday. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when we set up, I, I got to, I was producer of the Top of the Pops 2 website. I was, I was, I think, yeah, I was content producer, I was assistant producer on the main one. No, I was producer on the other one. Um, uh, but eventually, I produced <laughs> a Top of the Pops 2 website, and I got to interview people like Bucks Fizz and Human League and mm. all that kind of stuff. So, um, I was in my early 30s at the, at the time, and that was a, an awful lot of fun. But I was also working in the environment where the other um, websites were being made, uh, such as EastEnders as well, and also the Cult website. And you'll be aware, I'm sure, of James Goss, uh, a very familiar name yeah. to, to Doctor Who fans, who was, who was running that. And so I was very connected to him, and obviously we had that. I still have that friendship base, as I mentioned, with people like Clayton and, uh, and yeah, uh, Gary. Yeah. Uh, so I was kind of in the world, and I did get a sort of inkling that Dog 2 was coming back. I remember it was at Gary Russell's party. His, uh, it would have been his 40th birthday oh, really? party. People saying, oh, yeah, it's yeah. definitely coming back. It's, no, it is really coming back this time. I mm. think that would have been, let me guess, October 2003 or something. Uh, and yeah. an announcement came not long afterwards. So um, what happened then is the new series came out. Uh, and that was a massive success, obviously, and I absolutely loved it. And I sneaked mm. got to see a few episodes in advance because I reviewed some for James's website. But, um, nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, I felt, you know, I was really part of it then. Um, and then, you know, I kind of made a, a few connections, and I, there is an element of luck here. I um, got to meet a few people that were coming down from Cardiff to meet with James and chat with them and stuff like that. And once they identified that there was an opportunity uh, for, for this brand executive role in, in Cardiff, I was invited to apply mm. for it. And I had to go through the application process as, as long as, as well. As yeah, yeah, else. yeah, of course. Um, and it's kind of one of the, it was a new job and nobody really knew uh, what it was going to be. Being a fan was mm. part of it, but being a fan is not enough. And I think this is something that I faced throughout, throughout all the time I was there, that being a fan of Doctor Who doesn't mean that you can be brand manager of Doctor Who. In some ways, it doesn't mm. help. Because you've got to have that perspective of what the whole audience wants yeah. and what the BBC wants as well. Because you can take certain fans um, who just have 
I won't mention any names, but there's some some people that you know that have no idea of quality control who just want more dog two, more of it, and they don't care what it is. They just want yeah. more. Yeah. And, that's not and right probably thing. more of a very specific type yeah. of Doctor Who as well. Yeah, exactly. the, the ideal Absolutely. that exists yeah. in your mind. Yeah. So you need yeah. that sort of detachment and professional loyalty yeah. that allows you, you to and give the best to product be, to everybody. Yeah, you need to balance across the eras as well. So, um, mm. you know, I, I've certainly seen uh, collages done for, for designs with with one Doctor, say, say Colin Baker, is a bit smaller than the rest of them. And I've spoken to the design, designer and said, oh, well, that needs to be... Oh, I don't really like Colin's Doctor. And it's like, well, you know, Colin's Doctor is somebody's favourite Doctor. Mm. Uh, Colin Baker's favourite Doctor, for a start. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. <it's> like, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we sort of set a rule quite early on that apart from the incumbent Doctor, you know, everything had to get an equal uh, representation. Mm. So it's that kind of balance you've got to have. Being a fan is helpful that you've got to know your um your green death from your seeds of death uh um but mm-hmm. but but also having a perspective that is a bit wider uh, as well which i had um so so yes that was my career up until that point up until joining doctor who right yeah it, you you're right because and you know, we've talked about this before paul the show mm has to appeal to such a wide audience isn't it and you know l- like you say Edward you know the, the fans want certain things or the certain fans want certain things and others want other things but then there's the kids who are watching it and for the first know, time yeah for the first time mm. and you know it, it must have been quite challenging trying to hit all of those you know quadrants of of, of audience and the same when they when making the show as well you know it, and yeah, across I mean, all the different output as well you know yeah. all the, the the different I ranges think- the all the well, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. We sort of identified that young audience as the key audience and family audience mm. as well. I mean, the, the, nobody was pretending that the classic series didn't exist at all. In fact, quite early on um, in Russell's um, reboot of the series, it was quite heavily um, mentioned, you know, uh, School Reunion and that kind of stuff was bringing, mm. you know, not the first time it was brought back in, but suddenly bring it back in. But you had to think about the audience now. And already I could hear, you know, you, you don't try not to be swayed by it, but people going, oh, it needs to be 25 minute episodes again and four, four episode <laughs> stories and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. And um, people have such a, a desire for nostalgia that they sometimes don't realize that the world has changed. And, uh, mm. I mean, I'm sure you're probably uh, Facebook on on a Facebook group or some sort of social media group of of a town where you grew up, or you can imagine that. And there's always like pictures of of the city centre thirty, forty, fifty years ago, and there's mm, always someone yeah. that goes, "Oh, it was much better then." And you think, "Well, it was of course, really, yeah." You know, it, it, um, mm. you, you'd, you'd probably die from from cancer at the age of sixty five, and if you're a woman, you wouldn't be paid the same, and all the, you know all this kind of stuff. It's like life, yeah. life wasn't better then, and life has changed. And I think the same has to be remembered for doctors. Yeah. It's all about the future, and it's all about the current generation. Yeah. You've got to keep bringing totally in agree. Fans, mm. to keep doing that, and yeah. you shouldn't. You you don't want to dismiss the older fans at all. But if you get it right for this audience, then everybody else will follow. Um, and there'll be yeah. somebody listening to this uh, now going, "Oh, they don't care about us and and stuff." But you know, we do. <laughs> we just, uh, uh, do about care it. about it's it. Yeah. Time. But I think it's really important to to, mm. to hold on to the now um, in anything you're doing, mm. uh, which is uh, reaching an audience. Yeah, I, I think it's so important because if if there's no audience now, like you're saying, and no new people coming in, then then the show isn't going to continue. You know it. Mm. it you know, you've got all the old fans and, you know, people like us and stuff, but we'll always be here. Yeah, that's always be that's here, the thing, isn't it? But we're going to dwindle as we get older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you, you know, like you said, Edward, you've got to look to the mm. future. And I think it's, you know, we've again talked about this, but you know, with music and stuff and with, with bands, you know, people often know their first album was the best and, you know, well, actually it's, it's not, but you end up so, nostalgic for it that you well sometimes that you know, might be though but that's well, a that's I'm an sure opinion thing you know, isn't it yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. a slightly different thing but, but things have to move forward and, and <laughs> progress and, and bring new people in or, or else it just it just starts eating itself i think and you know it, it becomes creatively stifled i think so yeah 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 the, the, and the thing is if you try and hit if you try and keep everybody happy then you're watering down what you give to both sides of it really and the thing yeah, with someone like yeah. Doctor Who is there is there is a way of uh super serving that hardcore fan um these um blu-ray um 
reissues of the, of the various the collections CDs that we've been doing for a few mm. years now, five years or so. That's a great way of really making that um, uh, very much so dedicated fan happy, and that doesn't really impact yeah. on um, somebody who's just come <clears> to the show at all. So um, yeah. you know, it's finding ways to do to keep that happy. Uh, keep them happy um but you're always looking for new audiences as well i remember mm. um so this is jumping forward a bit but whilst it's in my memory uh when we That's introduced right. the character of bill um to peter capaldi's doctor i don't know if you remember but there was that short sketch um or short yes. uh, mini episode where they oh yes yeah yeah yeah, now, yeah. that was the broadcast in, it. Mm. in the middle of a football match um so it yeah. was half time and that, was, mm-hmm. uh, that went in there and I could—I remember a lot of Doctor Who fans sort of saying, "This is ridiculous. They don't know their audience." As if Doctor Who fans watch football and stuff like that. And it's like, well, Doctor Who fans are going to tune in anyway. But what we yeah. are doing yeah. with this particular audience is um, bringing in people that wouldn't normally watch yeah. Doctor Who, and they're going to watch it, and they might go, "Oh, this is quite good." Um, I mean, I think on that particular match, and I can't remember the statistics, but there was quite possibly a lot, uh, a younger black audience watching. And of course, Bill being right. a black actor, you wanted to sort of like show the, a representation yeah. of them, what something they can associate on screen. Yeah. So, uh, so you've always got to be thinking about who you can bring on board. You've got your people who are always going to be part of it, hopefully, um, and, and just think about what what other new people you can you can shovel along. Well, there's, there's always these um, marketing discussions, aren't there, on, online, which I'm sure you've seen as well, Edward. And, um, you know, In which everyone's an expert. You mean. Yeah, <laughs> and, the, and the show doesn't do enough and it isn't doing this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But what you've said is, is, you know, basically it, isn't it? You know, the Doctor Who fans, we're always going to watch. You know, we see the, the set reports <clears> and the leaks and all of that sort of stuff. But the, the, the casual audience who are not, you know, the hardcore obsessives like us... Yeah, you know, people wonder why there's not trailers on TV three months before the series airs because it, people won't remember. So mm, yeah. that's why it's two or three weeks before. And ev- every year these conversations come up. Don't they, Paul? And, and <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah say, I tend yeah. to just ignore them, Jeff. To yeah, be honest, he, he, he ignores it. Yeah, and, and I always <laughs> I'm say, good yeah, at that. It's the same. If, you know, every year it's the same. A couple of weeks before, because that's how you Very get easy. the yeah. the not us audience. You know. Yeah, I, mean, I think honest, what's interesting there aware. is is. I'll be honest, Sorry, I'm not on. aware of those marketing conversations. I don't follow them. I probably did at some point when I was... Good for you. Them, yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't. don't. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm certainly aware of that whole kind of thing where um, uh, people think, oh, they should be doing this, that, and the other. And, and you know, they could be right, but also at the same time, there's probably a very good reason why they're, they're not doing that. And that's, that, that's a perfect example. It's like um, you need to have a, a call to action. So um, whilst yeah. it could be tempting to say to people, this is coming soon, people go... Oh, that'll be back soon. Um, unless there's actually anything for them to do, then then it's kind of a, a waste of, of everybody's mm. time. So uh, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. So once it's kind of like um, you know, for example, with the song "Pre-Save This Now," you're like, oh, there's something I can do. Uh, but you know, otherwise it, it's kind of pointless. Mm. But um, but yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you don't. You it's, guys are very switched on. Well, well, well we, you, we yeah. try to be. It's because yeah. we're advanced in years. We've been through all that kind of stuff as young things, and now yeah. we're getting a little bit, or at least I am anyway. But it kind yeah. of reminds me, just talking about this stuff here, is, um, is, is, how, is how right that first series at the relaunch got it. Mm. You know what I mean? Because okay. it seemed it, it must have been such a risk at, at the time, even though it had the backing of some big names in the BBC and people seemed to be for it. Like you said at the start of this conversation, Edward, it, the, that 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 hangover from the 80s was always at the back of everybody's minds. The fact that it wasn't well loved at that time by the general audience and the fact that, you know, is, is, is the world ready for Doctor Who? Could, could Doctor Who even exist in the 21st century now? You know, well, so they, it, they it, it, everything you're, was you're done right, right and it worked. Yeah, they got it spot on. And, uh, you know, it's before my time, so I wasn't privy to all the conversations, but I did hear things that happened mm. you know, afterwards. And I think there were there was a lot of research done. And um, some of the things that came up from that research was that um, uh, people associated Doctor Who with wobbly old sets and uh, men in mm. rubber suits and stuff like that. And so, you know, there, there was a keenness quite early on to avoid anything which resemble that um uh, which is why although they did um, have sl- slitheen in rubber suits didn't they so <laughs> yeah, but, then, but, 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 but it works so 
but the, but Slovene, see, this is where Russell is such a genius. Is yeah, what Slovene does is it reverses it. It's actually a green monster in a human suit. And yeah, so yeah. You might be yeah, thinking yeah. that through too much, but that that is what what happened there, and that sort of probably seeped into people's psyche in a way. Uh, mm. I, I mean, I really do think that Russell is a genius in, in many ways, uh, but that, mm. that's an example of where where he got that absolutely right. Um, uh, uh, but but I think you know there was a big fear quite early on uh, to be very careful about stuff. So uh, quite early on in my time, there was a restriction put on. Uh, Mm. old episodes of Doctor Who, so they couldn't be shown without permission uh, because what we didn't All want right. to have, um, uh, it's not that they couldn't be shown, but if a clip was going to be used, uh, it had to be permission given permission given first from the production team. And that was just... Used in the series, do you mean, or used? In, how had it been used? Things, on other things. So on other things, had, okay, gotcha, yeah. So if you had, I don't know, um, uh, an actor appearing on... Um, uh, Jonathan Ross, whatever, was a big uh, interview show at the time. Right, and yeah. And he wants to say, well, you, of course, you used to be in Doctor Who. Uh, and perhaps it was one of those clips uh, or it was an episode they wanted to use where it was, you know, you, you could see that what they were going to do is, is take the mic out of Doctor Who and laugh about it. Mm. Then we yeah, probably yeah. Would say, mm, I'm not sure we want you to use that clip. Uh, and so that was uh, so that was one of the things that was put on as a restriction mm. uh, quite early on. Uh, and we didn't use it. We weren't heavy-handed with it. It was just awareness. And that way we got to know as well that, I don't know, Michael Jason is appearing on This Morning or something like that. And, and, and mm. uh, uh, So it was a good way to sort of find out what was happening. And I think that was a sensible move because, uh, there were, you know, don't assume that when Doctor Who came back, everyone started watching it. It took a little bit of a while. And there was still yeah. a lot of people that were like, oh, I don't want to watch that. That was rubbish. Mm. Uh, and we had to overcome they're that still first. carrying over that stuff aren't they so yeah. so i guess really you know it, it does go back to that thing of protect protecting your brand to a degree but ensuring the brand is maintained at a high threshold right in the in, in the sort of perception of your audience yeah i mean that that's that that's the ultimate thing about uh you know brand management is uh, i mean mm. essentially you want to make sure that if something's got the name doctor who on it um that it lives up to what the expectations of, of Doctor Who are. Um, and, yeah, you know, quality. Russell was busily uh, crafting an incredible family drama that uh, was high quality in terms of script, in, in terms of visual, mm. audio, everything. And therefore, if you if you buy a, a Doctor Who pen, obviously it's not going to be like that, but it's going to be of good quality. It's not going to be something that the ink doesn't work or the, the, the logo rubs off. That kind of stuff. Yeah, um, <laughs> my hands are turning green, and that's not the ink. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or, or what you could actually do, and this is something that was kind of addressed at some point by my colleagues at what was then BBC Worldwide, and I was a part of this. Is you think, well, actually, if it's a Doctor Who pen, what can it do that's different? And it could be that actually, you know, if, invisible ink or something. That's why it's a Doctor Who pen. Uh, yeah. Because otherwise, what you're doing is what's known as brand slapping, where you just put a logo yeah, yeah, on just slap a logo on something. Yeah. Mm. So, and I did see things like that. Uh, I, I think I saw a, a Doctor Who uh, barbecue kit at one point. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, but, I'm going to be on eBay looking for that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be fetching something now, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, and, and actually, just on that, so you were you were involved in a lot of those discussions. I'm assuming then as to where the brand was going to be applied and the licensing and stuff like that. Of, sort of, it wasn't kind of my decision. So basically, now the way mm. the BBC works is slightly different now. That's part of why my job went in, in, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is that um, it, in terms of the the core BBC, the public service side of it, is not able to make money, but it is it has sold the license mm. of its properties to the commercial side, which was BBC Worldwide, to be able to exploit yeah. it. Um, and so I work for the public service side um, and I would work alongside those commercial partners and they, they would make the decisions. They would go through all the rules and regulations uh, and yeah. they would say, we want to do this commercial thing. That would come back to the showrunners and to the BBC, the head, the very heads of the BBC and, and the showrunners who would say yes or no. And I might be involved in those chats, uh, you know, Certainly, as I became more experienced, I might be sort of like, oh, they're not going to like this, or it's going to have to be like this. But, that, but it wasn't my decision. Yeah, that would be somebody much far more senior's decision. Um, 
Mm. And then, then we would we would work it and make it happen. So yes, yeah, some decisions of, of things were made which I didn't approve of, I didn't like. Uh, in, in terms <laughs> of like uh, merchandise, there was a, a, a Doctor Who Mr. Potato Head, which I used to hate. Uh, I think it was the Matt Smith Doctor, <laughs> uh, and it was basically Mr. Yes. Potato Fez on it or something yeah. like that. And that that to me didn't feel that felt a bit like brand slapping. Uh, uh, yeah, but but you know th- those were my decisions to make. It was just once a decision had been made, I had to go with it and try and see what I could do to make yeah. it, uh, it as good as possible. How how does it work with um, you know licensing stuff? So do does a company come to you and say you know we we'd like to get the the Doctor Who license and we want to put it on you know pens and you know whatever or, or do do you approach places and say you know we're we're looking to uh, you know, it, it expand the brand, you know, would you be interested in, in taking it on or was it a bit of both? I'm not really sure because that wasn't my area. As I said, that was something right. that somebody else did. But I, my recollection is it, more, it was much more, uh, it came from elsewhere. Um, mm. uh, I mean, you might want to exploit um, opportunities. Um, but uh, as a public service broadcaster, you could never go, right, where can we make money? Let's go and uh, let's write something into the show where, where the doctor's got a motorcycle and then for let's go with Suzuki and try and do dog two motorcycles yeah. or anything like that. That that would that's not allowed. As much as people moan that the BBC isn't independent, it really is. It's just that the mm. mechanic doesn't exist to allow that to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think BBC Worldwide, as it then was, had a long list of people it was associated with licenses, um, and it would go through a stringent process as well. It wouldn't just license everything. Things had to be ethically made, for example. That kind yeah, of, of stuff. course. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and of course, there were a lot of things in place uh, with books and magazines already. Um, but uh, so, so yes, as far as I'm aware, uh, people would come to the BBC with an opportunity, and it would be considered. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I remember reading an interview with Russell T Davis at the start of that, or some point within that first series, or between the first and second, where he described how he kind of pulled everything back in. And yes. basically kind of, you know, they started everything from scratch, you know, as regards to licensing and, and, and everything from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was a very, very sensible move um, uh, mm. to, to do that, to sort of, you know, ground zero, uh, scorched earth policy to, so that they could start things afresh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one way of looking at it, isn't it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. But then again, you, you get ownership of the brand back, don't you? You know, and then it's down to you and the team and everybody else you're working with to kind of build that up and make sure you get the best figures, the best merchandise, clothing and toys, games yeah. and everything else that kind of goes with it. But then also the website as well, which um, I, did you say you, you were sort of involved in the early days of the website, it was that? Just the top um, of the pops, was it? To an extent, yes. Uh, and I was slightly involved in the dog too, uh, you know, in terms of a practical helping build stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I was, yes. Yeah. So what was your, I was going to say, what was your average day like when you were working Ooh. on the show? If there was such a thing? <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, there was no, there was no such thing as an average day. It was a great job. And I really <laughs> enjoyed the fact that it was so varied. Um, and mm. you'd come in and you would know what would be, you, you'd, ha- you'd have ongoing projects. So a new series launch um, and everything that went with that, that would be an ongoing thing that would start as soon as the series started filming right up until it had gone out. So you'd be already talking to the people that were going to be across the, yeah. the the photos, the PR, you'd be talking to um, uh, people about licensing opportunities uh, if they were already a licensee. So for example, character options you might say well there's this 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 and this character and all that kind of stuff so those are ongoing projects and then there would be firefighting from day to day where um <laughs> you know some a request would come in and you'd have to deal with that so uh i can it, it definitely felt like it went in cycles because almost every series of doctor who that i worked on had something really big to promote it with so i started on that second series and then the third series we had Freema. the fourth series we had Mm. Um, uh, Catherine and then of course the fifth series was a new doctor um, and so on and so forth so it was always something new so these big yearly or yearly-ish cycles of of things happening and then just lots of little opportunities that come Um, but yeah you'd come into the office generally you come into the office and you'd log on to email and and you'd have conversations with people Um, but in that day I would get to uh, do all sorts of things from reading the next uh, big finish script to um, checking out the artwork on a Doctor Who magazine um, 
mm. comic strip. Popped to set to see Matt Smith or David Tennant or Peter Capaldi to to ask them something. Yeah. Uh, pop into post production to make sure that they could send clips to Australia. Um, send an email to uh, BBC Worldwide to arrange um, a, a discussion about what was going to happen at the Doctor Who experience, that kind of stuff. It was, there was a lot of plates that were being sp- uh, spun yeah. mm. at the same time. It was great, and I really, really enjoyed it. <laughs> to an extent, I miss uh, having that kind yeah. of variety uh, uh, going on, you know, just so much, so much to be involved with. Yeah, how, huge, how, huge amount of stuff. How, how yeah. big was your team, Edward? So uh, I, I started off kind of like there was what there were two of us there, there was my boss Ian mm. and then we brought in other people um, uh, and the, and I think at one point there may have been about it was Ian then me then three or four people underneath me or or side yeah alongside me and, and underneath me and then that kind of changed and then Ian left and I was sort of at the top for a while um, and then there were counterparts at BBC Worldwide so it's kind of like kind of the same sort of team it's difficult structure yeah like an extended but but there was never just one person it was there was always a handful Mm. of people people would get involved uh and you know that was great because people had different levels of um experience and also different areas of expertise um Mm. i think i was always seen as the doc two expert um uh pretty much you know at certain points with the part with the exception of the showrunners people would come to me with questions because i knew so much (laughs) so uh yeah so that was great. I think I've forgotten it all now. No, it's all there still somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not that far away that those no, no, no. Have, it's have wired into your DNA. <laughs> um, did did, um, did any of you expect the show to become as as big as it did? You know, particularly from se- season two onwards. Not really, but at the same time, it was kind of what we were looking for. So mm. uh, um, you know, I, the, season two, season one had been a success. Season two, uh, no one would knew how it, knew how it would go. Billy was the one, uh, Rose was the one that everyone thought, oh, this is big. Let's hope the new Doctor mm. works. Of course, what happened across that is uh, David Tennant's star ascended hugely in both series three <laughs> yeah. and series four. Doctor Who was just absolutely everywhere. Mm. And David became so, so famous. None of us knew how to deal with that. We didn't know. We weren't. Yeah sure how to deal with that kind of fame that level of fame for david david didn't know um mm. that kind of thing hadn't existed in the uk for a long time he was he was of hollywood star quality yeah. in in the uk and i would experience it when i was uh, out and about with david either at particular events where you would kind of expect it but also you know uh, i'd see david sort of you know i'd bump into him in the shops and we'd be chatting and he'd have his hat and scarf on and he would look a bit worried. And it's because he didn't want people to recognize him because he would mm. be swamped there. And the same went for Russell. Mm. Whenever we did an event and Russell came along to that, it was always a big problem sort of managing because Russell and, and, you know, all these actors and, and people like Russell always want to give as much as they can to the fans, but you've kind of got to yeah. make their life livable as well uh, yeah. <laughs> and sort of manage everything <laughs> around it. So, so the show became so huge and no, no one expected it, but at the same time, that's what we were trying to do. We were always concerned that yeah, you know, yeah. when shows like, uh, I can't remember what it was called at the time, but the equivalent of Britain's Got Talent, when that was going out against Doctor Who in you know around 2007, 2008, maybe that was the show, I'm not sure. There was a lot of concern that Doctor Who would yeah. suffer, so we would do mm. extra activity to try and push that. Uh, or if yeah. um, it was going to be off air because of Eurovision for a week, what could we do to make sure that people didn't forget about it? So Just to plug that gap. Yeah, so so we were doing that. So we weren't entirely uh, surprised that it was a success. But I don't think... I mean, mm. you would have heard people say this. I'm going to quibble it, um, make it sound similar to fame. But you've heard famous people say they've always wanted to be famous, but until it happened, they didn't know exactly what it was. Well, it was kind of like that for the yeah. show, and we were very associated with it. To, so to see that show become so big... Um, and I don't think you... Uh, I, I, you should forget just how big it was in sort of 2008 era yeah it was really really enormous it really uh, captured the imagination of that uh young audience uh, let's say they were 11 years old that's an average mm. uh, yeah and, you know it was it was fantastic to be involved in something that um I bet. everyone had an opinion on you told them you worked on doctor <laughs> and they have something yeah. to say and hopefully yeah they're positive. <laughs> so slightly um diverting for a minute um 
you know, like you said, the show was absolutely massive then. Sometimes you see these pictures online of the, um, you know, Woolworths. If anyone listening doesn't know what Woolworths is, it was a shop where you could buy everything and now you can't, mm. you, we don't have it anymore. But the huge, uh, you know, who displays in Woolworths oh, and stuff yeah, and yeah. all the toys and yeah. stuff and, you know, remote control Daleks and things. And, you know, things were obviously a bit different today. And, and there's always talk of, you know, that the show isn't as popular as it was and stuff like that, which, which I don't really believe. But what would you say, Edward, about like how the landscape has changed in things like that and, you, you know, the, the way... Because you don't even get it in the shops now. I You know, I go to the toy shops with, with my kids and, you know, even the biggest things that sort of seem most popular don't have huge wall displays like that anymore and things. It's Everything seems very different now. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't, you know, I'll be honest, I don't really keep up with, with uh, what's happening on uh, in terms of Doctor Who's popularity these days simply because I'm, I'm just enjoying being a fan, uh, particularly with these last mm. few episodes. They've just been absolutely brilliant. And I, and I certainly don't want yeah. to, uh, to get involved in anything again. But um, I do feel <laughs> that it, uh, it is different. I think we had a bit of uh, the way things went in terms of, let's call it a fantasy element of show, um, just to sort of be a bit broad about it. Um, we had obviously Doctor Who and, and a few other shows that were similar became really big. And that was a really new thing when it happened in the late noughties. It hadn't mm. happened since Star Wars days, really. Um uh, mm. And then that sort of uh, accelerated with things like the Marvel and the DC films. And that feels like that's kind of peaked and there's been a bit of a pushback now. Mm. Maybe people are less interested in that. Yeah, sort of I agree. Thing. So I think, and I think, and you're probably right. I, I, I haven't been in a children's TV, children's shop since uh, I was working on Dog 2. But uh, if that's the case, then it probably is just that, you know, that's not where the interest is at the moment. Um, mm. So I, I wouldn't... I don't think anyone needs to worry about Doctor Who's popularity being less. It's still uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier about research. Uh, you know, in uh, back in you know two thousand three or four, whenever, of what did people think of the show? What were their memories of it and things like that? And I remember, uh, I think it was during Capaldi's time. I was on a, I got a weekly uh, email to to uh, rate the episode and what I liked and what I didn't like and things like that. And, you know, I assume that kind of stuff goes on all the time. And, you know, there's a lot of research done into things. One of my, uh, you know, favorite things is when, uh, so I'm a big Avatar fan and people say no one likes it. And, and I think they wouldn't have a theme park at Disney World if there was really no fans. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. research would have been done. And, you know, Disney wouldn't have got involved with Doctor Who if they didn't think there was an audience there and, you know, it had legs and all of that stuff. So I, I think, uh, you know, uh, none of this stuff is kind of done willy-nilly, is it? You know, and, No, I uh, think it's all... Because of what happened to the show in the 80s where it got effectively cancelled, uh, there's a paranoia, mm. even amongst the perhaps people that weren't around then, because they're aware that Doctor Who was a series that was cancelled. And, and, and in the way that any of us who've gone through something traumatic in our lives probably have a bit of an area where we're, we're, we get a bit concerned and a bit touchy about. And I think Doctor Who fans are always worried about that. And I see some of the things happen uh, with other shows. I'm also a big fan of EastEnders. I love EastEnders. Uh, and mm. I don't really venture into the world of EastEnders, but you know, by proxy things come into my feed on social media. And they're always worried that that's going to get cancelled as well you know if, if the ratings are down by five hundred thousand one week uh it's it's terrible and uh this is what yeah. BBC needs to do so um i think i think there's a you need to look at the general picture and, and see how it's relating to other things um and what the general feeling is and i think you know uh there has been perhaps from what i've observed as a very casual observer um a, a slightly less interest in doc two over the last few years and it's not been on air very much that's so probably got a lot to do with it mm. but from what i can see now it's it's very uh exciting and people are extremely uh um uh, looking forward to this new era i know i am uh so mm. uh, don't mm. don't worry about it being cancelled just enjoy it yourselves i know that's hard to do because when you enjoy, <laughs> enjoy it, it. Share that's, it. The, that's the thing uh, but just just get mm. what you 
get out of it. Don't watch something worrying about what other people think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, try your hardest to do that. As hard as it is, just just enjoy what you're enjoying. If you're not enjoying it, that's fine. But don't not enjoy it because you're worried about what other people think of it. That's my yeah. advice. And I think you're you're right. You know, it's it's probably because the show was cancelled back in 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 the eighties and the TV movie didn't work. So there's this probably constant worry that you know it's it's going to happen again and you know people always bang on about the ratings and stuff and they're, they're, they're not what they were but the world has changed again yeah. isn't it you know we've got the way the way we watch tv has totally yeah, the, changed the way we watch video mm. games and you know 20 odd years ago nearly when the show came back we only really had five channels yeah. yeah. Now, now look at what we've got. So, of course, things are going to be. Different. Hey, when I were a lad, you know, there were only three channels. What are you talking yeah, about? And, and, hey? you didn't have, and you didn't have color, did you? you know? hey, and we had to move my dad into the aerial and stick it on his head <laughs> so we could get a picture. Like, you know, all right. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, if the TV movie hadn't bombed, I don't think the series that came afterwards would have worked because. Um, it was, no, great. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't have happened that way. And also, I think. The TV movie is great, but you can also see within the first thirty seconds why it didn't mm. work. Yeah, my opening exactly. line is my yeah. old friends, the 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 master, and, and my enemies, the Daleks, and all that kind of stuff. You, you I know it's, it's pushing all the backstory it's into like, it. Sure, you know, yeah, backstory needs. Yeah, to be yeah. Open. So what the hell is it? Yeah, mm. so and, you know that's what. Nostalgia there, yeah. Yeah, and that's what's been learned, and that's why every few years now the series seems to uh, re reboot itself very effectively. Uh, and yeah, yeah. which is what like Doctor Who's always done, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. what it's always been good at. It's yeah. what's always contributed towards its longevity. Yeah, yeah, definitely without a doubt. So, Edward, tell us a little bit about working with with each of the Doctors that you were involved in, and um, you know what what they were like, and uh, maybe you could share a, a behind the scenes story or a, a secret about about uh, <laughs> each of them. Or, or good memory. Keep not, it not clean. Like a, yeah. yeah, not, not some sort of. We're not after revelation. dishing the dirt or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. Well, unless you want to. I don't to. have any shocking relations. I mean, I wouldn't give any shocking revelations, but I don't think I've got any to give yeah. anyway. Quite right. Uh, it, it's, uh, I mean, I, you know, my principal doctors I worked with were David, Matt, and then Peter. Mm. But across the way, uh, you know, I also got, you know, with we, we got involved with a lot of other ones. Peter Davison did Time Crash. Uh, yeah. Colin Baker came on set during Voyage of the Damned. Mm. Uh, uh, John Hurt, uh, Paul McGann, etc. All those people got involved. Tom Baker, but um, and then you know I've met them most of them si- either since or during my time in a uh, I was going to say personal capacity, but I suppose it is as in I'm you know doing conventions and that yeah. kind of stuff. So I've kind of got an opinion on, on all of them. I've not met William Hartnell, Patrick Troughton, and John Pertwee for obvious reasons. I've not met Joe. Well, I, you can't be a real fan then, can you? <laughs> 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 yeah, I've not met Jodie Whittaker um, or Christopher Eccleston. I've met Shooty uh, mm. in a totally different capacity. So I've kind of met a lot of them, really. But obviously, I work with those, yeah. those three. That's, that's a good roll call. Yeah, it's not bad, is yeah. it? Uh, you know, David was my mm. first doctor, and I adored David. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have to explain why, do I? Uh, I think anyone who's seen him as a doctor just knows that he's brilliant. And I think if you've seen a single interview with him, you can see what a, a great great guy he is um yeah yeah i can remember my very first time of meeting david was on set uh during the filming for army of ghosts or doomsday i can't remember but somebody will know this it's the scene where him and Mm. jackie are in torchwood and they've got the magna clamps uh, and jackie says something like i I could do with those for my shopping and they're sort of crawling across the floor with magna clamps that was the scene i watched it was in a in a uh an Air Force hangar being filmed. Um, and <laughs> the reason I was there was because I just had the illustrations through of um, David Tennant's or the 10th Doctor's uh, comic strip for um, oh, Doctor Who yeah. magazine then. And so mm. David, or well, all actors have a likeness approval. So I had to show it to him to make sure he was happy. So I was waiting there oh, right. and, uh, uh, and then I was introduced to him, uh, you know, chatted to him. He was, he was lovely. He was really nice. Uh, and you know he he was so excited to see that as you can imagine. I mean, yeah. we all know that he was he grew up a fan. So yes, yeah, yeah, so that was my yeah. very first memory of of uh, David Tennant. Um, I'll just tell you my first memories of them all. That way, uh, that's that's quite yeah, gone. Yeah, go for it. Uh, my first memory of Matt Smith was uh, slightly turned around, really, because uh, what happened is he'd been announced as the Doctor. 
when was that? Was that mm. the beginning of 2009, I think it was, wasn't it? I think. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Let's, let's well, say there yes. Was, there yes. was a TV special to introduce yes. him, wasn't there? Yes, that's right. And then he took over properly. Um, mm. A generation was a year later. Anyway, uh, and a few weeks or maybe months later, uh, there was a bit of a change around behind the scenes, as you're aware. And, of course, uh, mm. I work with BBC Worldwide because there's always – a bit of concern from licensees or is Doctor going to be very different? What's the new Doctor going to be like and stuff? Um, mm. David had been so popular. So there, there was a there was always a meeting where licensees were brought to go and give some advice about the new series. But this mm. time what was happening is they were given the opportunity not only to meet Stephen, who was taking over a showrunner, but to meet Matt Smith. Just a little, you know, uh, right. in a, you know a conference centre sort of like, right, yeah. this is us and, and see, we're going to go in. We can have Weeping Angels. We can have new companions and all that kind of stuff. So I got to meet uh, Matt there, but I met him beforehand. I, he was given my contact number uh, at Television Centre. I had to meet him. And then we were going to wander up the road to see the colleagues at um, BBC Worldwide. So I remember waiting there um, uh, at, at the reception desk. Um, mm. and getting a text or, or what have you saying, oh, it's me, Matt, where are you, etc. And him coming out hmm. and sort of high and him sort of like coming up and embracing me straight away uh, and then saying, can I get you a cup of tea? And I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, all right. And he went off with a cup of tea. <laughs> and, it's, and I was like, this is, this is strange. <laughs> the doctor's buying the tea. You. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but that was really great and that was a really good – because he yeah. didn't start filming then until, you know, six months later. Mm. So to have had that sort of um, to be in a face early on for him, I think was helpful mm. for me in my yeah. work, uh, but, you know, just created a bond, etc. And, he, you know, he was very excited, um, as you can, uh, you know, might imagine. We also got to do that um, mm. tour of the country when his series launched or before it launched. Of course. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that was that. one of my um, up, mm. upcoming questions. We can possibly um, come to my mum lives in Inverness. Uh, Yes. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, c- 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 carry on. Uh, well, yeah, so we were part of that, and I'll let you ask any questions about that when, when we okay. get to it. Um, <laughs> Peter, uh, Peter Capaldi um, was different yet again. Uh, yeah. So if you remember, there was that show that announced him. Yes, and, indeed. Mm. Uh, uh, was, was Zoe Ball was interviewing people, and then she made the announcement. Nobody knew, absolutely nobody knew. I know oh, really? somebody made a slip. Was it yeah. Rufus Howe made a slip and said Peter? Uh, but that was but like I thought he meant Peter Davison. Yeah, but... I think he did. He he did not know, mm. and everyone says after oh, it was just one of those unfortunate you. things, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, absolutely, we 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 had Peter there under a shroud. Nobody, nobody knew. I don't know, <laughs> <he was> <laughs> knew. <laughs> which he was, was obviously such, up for. <laughs> it was such secrecy, and because of the way BBC operates, because we were saying that we had to have people there, sort of almost legal people, making sure that nobody did know. So anyone that thinks it was all just, oh my you know, goodness, it wasn't. It, I'm going a bit over top about how it was, but you know, this, this really was, I'd met Peter earlier that day. It was a Sunday. I'd met him in Crouch End uh, at about 10 o'clock that mm. morning, along with Brian Minchin, our executive producer. And we did a photo shoot with him with Rankin. Um, and uh, I think the shot is something like that, isn't it? Uh, which he, then yeah, he's got his hand. He's like that. Yes. Yeah. And, then a, and I, that was fantastic. So I was a big, big fan of Rankin's photography. So to go to his studio, mm. Uh, and meet Peter Capaldi as well and uh, his agent Lindy uh, and spend the day with him um, you know and watching a photo shoot by one of the you know the most famous uh, British photographers uh, was really exciting yeah. and then we all got in a taxi yeah. and we went up to Elstree and uh, I can't I don't know if we did literally put the cloak over Peter but we were very careful like the car came in and drove around the back and he went through a side door and was <laughs> kept in a room uh, uh, so mm. um, but I hadn't known it was Peter until um, that morning yes so right. if you remember uh it was all very secret and i think on the thursday or the friday people started saying oh, i wonder if it's peter capaldi and even in our office uh and i worked in the doctor production <laughs> office uh none of us knew i'm sure there were people in really? that really you know, but no, nobody talked about mm. it and suddenly it made sense it when people said peter capaldi and everyone's like oh yeah yeah oh, yes Oh, I can see that happening. And of course, people tend to rewrite yeah. history now. They're like, oh, everybody knew it was Peter Capaldi. They didn't, you know. It, it, it made everybody a lot of knew. sense when, mm. when those rumours came out. So it wasn't a huge surprise on the Sunday because the rumour mill had been turning at full speed. Mm. Uh, but but um, it wasn't until Sunday morning. I was literally at Crouch End on the corner of the street waiting for Brian. Brian turned up and said, it is Peter Capaldi and you're going to meet him now. So, uh, so that's how that went. So, uh, uh, you know, Peter was great because uh, I, I 
may have met him before. I think I had possibly when he'd worked on uh, the show or tortured um, previously. But he was, you know, a much more famous actor than than, than the others had been when they were cast. Yeah, yeah. So to meet him uh, was, was exceptional, and just to be very excited about the energy that he was going to bring uh, to the show as well. Mm. Uh, I really liked all of them. I don't have a favorite, and you know, of all the other doctors I've met. They're all so different. It's, you know, uh, yeah, to, they're all very good. Particular memories of, of things and you've gone through certain things together. Uh, but, but yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate to work with, you know, th- in my opinion, three of the best doctors. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so you um, had quite a big hand in, in a number of the events that took place across the, uh, the time you were involved, mm-hmm. didn't you? So like the, the proms and the symphonic spectacular events. And um, I don't think you went to any of these, did you, Paul? But I, and, and like the exhibitions and stuff. And I remember, um, you know, going to, to all of these, you know, there was one in London where you, it, it was around Matt's time and, and the TARDIS kind of materialised behind a curtain and you, you walked through it and went into the control room um, and then, uh, you know, of course, the, the exhibition uh, in Cardiff, I went to Cardiff once to film in, in Cardiff Bay and um, we had to film once the sun went down. So I made sure we arrived early so I could go to the Doctor Who <laughs> place, you know, and the rest of my crew were like, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, do you want to work or do you not want to work? <laughs> so, we, so we did that. And I remember going to uh, Wembley Arena for uh, the, the Monsters show, you know, where... Um, you know, they came out in the audience and stuff like that. And it was opening night. Matt Smith was there. He, he stood up and everyone cheered him and stuff. So mm. t- tell us a little bit about all of that that stuff and how they came about. Well, I've got a lot of uh, fondness for that, actually. Um, mm. uh, that, that whole sort of point in time, because uh, it had happened organically. I think um, the first thing that happened was the Children in Need concert. Oh, which yeah. had taken place in 2006 in mm. Wales. Uh, and what had happened is the BBC National Orchestra <clears> of Wales <throat> had possibly approached Julie Gardner or possibly the other way around about doing some sort of concert of, of Murray's music. Um, and what's the key linchpin then there is the, the person that was involved is a chap called Paul Bullock, who uh, was an exec, or is an exec producer at BBC Music or Factual Entertainment right. in, in Wales. And, and so he organised that and, and Paul is a, a force <clears> of nature. Uh, I, I'm saying this partly because he still employs me from time to time on, on other projects. <laughs> but uh, but he he then helped broker a relationship. When that was successful, helped Judy broker a relationship with yeah. uh, the Proms people. That wasn't straightforward. The Proms people didn't want to do a Doctor Who Prom. They always did something like a Blue Peter Prom or a Children's Prom, which was a vehicle for getting mm. uh, young people interested in, in classical music. And I don't think mm. any of them quite got Doctor Who. So there was a lot of hard work done before that was even agreed. And then I was very much involved with um, Paul and his team in making that first prom in 2008, uh, I think it was. Um, yeah. Uh, and and helping create that show. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's hard to say what my involvement was other than it was you know, <laughs> a lot of it. I enjoyed that enormously. It's across yeah. the board. Yeah. And then that developed... You know, there was another show that happened two years later, um, and then that that evolved into the commercial version, which was the Symphonic Spectacular, which first of all happened in Australia. Um, I was extremely lucky; it happened a few times that I got to go out and be the Doctor Who representative there, because obviously nice. you're taking the Doctor Who property all the way to the other side of the world. And although by this point Paul and his team knew it well, uh, mm. they didn't know it well enough. Uh, and there was no way that uh, Stephen Moffat could go out there or whoever was mm. uh, uh, working alongside him at the time could go out there. So I went, uh, and that was great. Um, you know, we ended up doing one on, at the Sydney Opera House as well. So, uh, yeah. you know, one of my fondest memories of, of working on Doctor Who's is pushing a, a Dalek onto the stage at the Sydney Opera House, which was, uh, <laughs> which was, which was definitely... To me, uh, to you, to me. Yeah, to you. Exactly. Not, uh, <laughs> not an experience that everybody has. Um, <laughs> So that kind of grew and grew, and I th- and, and yes, mm. you, the monsters are coming, and the, the other versions of it that um, that sort of became uh, commercial shows as well. I was involved in those to an extent, not in the same way, but probably in in the same way as I was with magazines or books and that kind of mm. stuff. And yeah, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. want to take all ownership for this. There were other people in the team that were involved in certain areas more than me, uh, etc. The proms itself, I think, was very much my kind of thing. 
so so yes, so that that sort of happened. Then the experience was now I I I was across that, but that was a colleague of mine, Beth Britton, mm. who was much more involved in that, uh, and Stephen Nicholas as well. They they were very much the the contacts that were across making sure that the assets that went between Doctor Who production and the experience and the experience knew about what was coming up so that yeah because there was a few exhibitions you mentioned you mentioned one in it there was mm. one in Earl's Court there was one in Brighton yeah. at one point uh and then there was one in Cardiff in the Red Dragon Centre way before we had the Doctor experience of course I go back yeah. I remember Blackpool I went to in 1979 yeah, me and too. Mm. I went to and I was at Longleat at the 20th anniversary in 1983 as well oh were you yes yes so I've got hardcore uh, yeah you know, I've I've got all these recollections of the various things, but the experience I think was particularly mm. good. Uh, um, as I'm sure you, you witnessed, it was it was a really great mm. interactive experience with lots of exciting things happening. I'm very proud of that, and and the, the yeah, it was brilliant. Reason, reasonably small involvement I had in that was 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 just wonderful. Uh, it's a it's a shame it's not with us any longer, but I'm sure there's yes, yeah. much fun. missed. Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, so you, you mentioned just earlier about the um, uh, the tour that Matt and Karen went on uh, around the country. It was bonkers, wasn't it? They were like, you know, rock stars or something. Oh, it was brilliant. Say, my yeah. my mum lives in Inverness, which is where Karen's from, and, and there was a photo shoot on the side of Loch Ness, wasn't there, I think? And, uh, yeah, ridiculously early my in the day. Uh, yeah. And uh, so was that all done? Was it done over the course of a week or something? All of that? Or... Yeah, that was that was planned with um, military like um, uh, precision uh, <laughs> again by uh, my colleague Beth Britton, um, who did a fantastic job. I think it was Piers Wenger who was the showrunner at the time, along with Stephen. Mm. So let's do something like the um, X Factor bus when you see it turn up in different cities. <laughs> and, you know, that's where the, the heat's going to be. Let's do something like that. We need to do something different. Matt isn't known, Karen isn't known, and we need to sort of make mm-hmm. sure we're reaching the core audience and sort of get in there and get the local news and, and bring the fans on as well, because as we know, the fans are going to talk about it, but also get some, you know, let's not just rely on the Graham Norton show or the one show, <laughs> sort of, you know, grassroots, as it were. And so yeah. that was a, a fantastic thing where uh, we had a bus, we, you know, uh, we had a bus. That it was had that great artwork on it, didn't it? It did, yeah. So it was branded or wrapped, as it was called, uh, with the Doctor Who artwork. And, you know, that bus travelled around. I think what happened is yeah. it went out to Northern Ireland first, ahead of us. We all flew out to Northern Ireland's Belfast, and that's where it started. <laughs> and it was really interesting. In each city, the um, the interest and in, uh, Matt and Karen's star grew. So in Belfast, there was kind of a vague interest uh, so we did a screening mm. and uh, there were fans there and there were fans outside and we're like, oh, this is great. Uh, but as we went across the whole country, by the time we got to, to London at the end, you know, it felt like he was massively famous. Um, yeah, the word yeah. spread, yeah. But yeah, so what had happened is we then got the ferry across from Ireland to, I'm not sure where we landed, but we, we then made our way up to Inverness because there was a connection with Inverness because you said as, as Karen um, uh, was from there. And what I can yeah. remember, so this would have been April or very late March, is it was snowing and it was snowing so badly we were really lucky. Uh, it was at night time we were travelling. They were closing the roads behind us. We were just yeah. luckily just slightly ahead so that roads got ahead of it. Closed because mm. it was snowing so heavily. We got to Inverness quite late. Uh, I almost felt like I had jet lag. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> I mean, it's far away. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done that drive. It's uh, it's brutal yes, in the wrong weather. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I can remember getting to the bar and having a drink, and then it was like, no, you're gonna go to bed. Everyone's gonna go to bed now because we've got to be up at yeah. two o'clock in the morning. We did that photo shoot uh, mm. uh, at Loch Ness. Uh, you know, it, there was no jolly to this at all. It was non-stop work, and I think uh, I can't remember if we went to Karen's school or something like that. But we sort of did something that inter, in, you know, sort yeah. of touched on her. Her upbringing, we did a screening there. And I think we then sort of did Newcastle, Gateshead, uh, mm. went over to Salford. And then we ended up in Northampton, uh, for, which is where Matt was from, and went to his school. And that was really good. And there was a lot more press involved at this point. Yeah, so we they caught see up. There's a story, isn't there? You know, he's gone yeah. back to his, his school. Um, and uh, that was a lot of fun because we had his football coach there, Matt, as you may recall. Oh, so, right, yeah, because yeah, he's big he, on the football, he, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah footballer yeah uh, mm. and so that was great to see i think we took pictures of them together and uh, and yeah we sort of we sort of came around and and you know, 
Cardiff was in there somewhere. Maybe we started at Cardiff, I can't remember, or ended at Cardiff. <laughs> but obviously that was... <laughs> it's all a bit of a blur now, and it was quite some time. Yeah, I imagine it is, actually. Because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, then it was the whole 50th as well, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. going to ask about that, yeah. yeah. The 50th uh, celebration uh, event was an epic, wasn't well, it? Was... So you, you were quite involved in that, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was. There was a lot done for the 50th, and something that Stephen said quite early on... Mm. Uh, it's first of all, I mentioned brand slapping earlier. We're not just going to 50th slap everything. He didn't mm, want yeah. merchandise to be sold because it suddenly had a badge on it saying 50th anniversary, which I completely get. Um, and I think anything that, you know, things did have that badge on it if it was reissued or, or you know, it was from that year. But he didn't want mm. to, you know, the whole target range reissued with that on it, that kind of stuff. The other thing he said is, no, let's not announce what we're doing because people will only be disappointed. We can announce that we're doing 30 things and that won't be enough. So if we mm. don't really announce things, uh, then there's nothing for people to be disappointed by, which was a very sensible idea and probably the the, the only way to do it. But as a yeah. result, I think there was a lot of uh, feeling from fans that we weren't doing anything and a lot of anger. <laughs> and this was a point where you know the online world was... Or, or Twitter uh, was really sort of becoming a thing because obviously forums had existed for a while. Yeah, and yeah. I just remember there was a lot of unpleasantness, and maybe that was at about the point that Stephen decided to leave Twitter, uh, or mm. uh, you know, and people like that. Uh, and I certainly, even you know, uh, my reasonably anonymous capacity, although you kindly say maybe fans know who I am, sort of uh, received a lot of very nasty things, uh, really, really nasty, mm. or personal things. You know, people that would like. Um, I can always remember uh, saying something about an episode that I didn't particularly like or something, um, an old episode uh, that, you know, it was all mm. right, it was quite good, but not my favourite or something like that. And then suddenly people were finding personal pictures of me uh, and saying how awful I was and, and all this kind of stuff, just really mm. nasty stuff. Um, what happened is when, you know, by the end of that year, and I can't remember everything we did, but obviously you had the 50th programme, you had an adventure in space and time, you had the Paul mm. McGann uh, yeah. special, just yeah. to some the night TV of the doctor. stuff that happened. You had yeah. missing episodes come back, you had lots of great merchandise, you had that 50th um, celebration, you had the, the 50th prom as well. Uh, by the end of it, everyone was satisfied and everyone was thinking how brilliant the BBC had done, but it was yeah. not a very yeah. nice process to go through from certain areas of fandom along the way. Uh, but that's something I've taken with me, and you know, I, I, I've mm. you know, it's, all, it's all a learning process curve. But uh, yeah, but it's it's um, very sad when that sort of stuff happens, and I think <clears throat> people can. It's easy to kind of fire off shots and stuff at people. Oh, uh, especially from the comfort yeah. of your own living room, where yeah. you don't have to actually look at somebody in the eye face to yeah. face and tell them stuff that you would just rattle out on your Which phone. You'd never say, f you know, face to face. Mm. And also, I think people, you know, take the piss out of a, a, an act or you know, criticize them or whatever, but but forget that they're a real person, you know, and and yeah, and you, you've. Uh, sadly experienced things and you know Stephen did and, and Chris yeah. and Russell they, you know everyone has and, and I think mm. th there's such a thing these days about you know negativity and criticizing stuff and you know we're not <laughs> into that at all you know uh, no. the, the two of us but well, I'm very pleased when it that. gets pe personal like that I, I think it, it you know it, it crosses a line and um, it does cross a line yeah yeah and it's it's very sad really when mm. you know and I think yeah. uh and it's not, you know, this yeah, isn't a Doctor Who thing. Mm -hmm. This isn't a Doctor Who thing. This happens in all. No, it's not. No, it's across. Things. It's across social media. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah. And, and I think Star Wars and the way people have. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've I've sort of dipped my my feet into other fandoms. Uh, in, in yeah. Uh, and you kind of straight back it. out again. I feel completely removed from the Doctor Who fandom now, so I I don't see. Uh, I see there's a slight obsession with what Ian Levine thinks of things, and all I will say is it doesn't matter what Ian Levine thinks of things. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's it. The, the, yeah. I, I, I yeah. don't really know what happens. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. But, you know, the, I think what we delivered in the 50th w was just brilliant. Mm. And, you know, there's a, oh, uh, it was honestly, Edward, it, was it was incredible. Absolutely yeah, amazing. It really was. Know, there was something right. for everybody, wasn't there? Yeah. I think. It really yeah, was. You, you had the, mm. yeah. The, the showy elements like um you, you know the 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 cast coming up and talking and then I, I was there Saturday when Tom Baker was there as well and you know the yeah. the older doctors came out 
and then Tom comes out and he, he's got his walking stick and, you know, mm. the place went mental and, and you know, he, he was sort of acting like, you know, I can't be bothered with this, but you knew inside he, oh, he was loving it. He was loving know, it. He, yeah. he, he sat down and, you know, he, he was marvellous and then Danny Hargreaves blew up some Cybermen <laughs> later. And, because you know, why not? Was, yeah, and then there was the sort of production insight, you know, the sets and, you know, yes, costume stuff yeah. and things. And uh, I, I met Matt and Jenna there and uh, my wife and I had our, our photo uh, taken with them. My wife's not really a fan of the show, but uh, she, she does like Matt. And, and uh, so she came along and actually, you know, the, the fact that she had a good time. That uh, says something, doesn't it? It says, yeah, you know, um, yeah. and it, it was just a, a, a wonderful day. Mm. I've, I've got a, I'll have to share it on, on our Twitter and stuff later, Paul. I, I shot a little bit of video there and, and made a little, you know, edit of it. But it was <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. And then afterwards, there was the screening of Day of the Doctor. And yes. somehow I missed out on getting a ticket for the evening uh, the screening at Excel. So we went to a cinema nearby and watched it in 3D right. and stuff. And, you know, so a, a whole day, you know, filled mm. with who and, and, you know, fans and people in cosplay and, you know, all of this stuff. And it was just, it was wonderful. And so was the one a couple of years later with, with Peter and Jenna at as yes. well. That, that was brilliant. Oh, well, I'm glad. So I'm what glad what you was it like it. putting all that on? It must have been... A- absolutely it's been a yeah, whirlwind I did, I did thank you yeah yeah it must yeah. have been bonkers doing all of that oh gosh yeah <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's like anything it's like a roller coaster and, and it's a long time going uphill then yeah you know, when it starts you just like you have to go with it um and you know uh i just remember being utterly exhausted by the end of it um uh, <laughs> But very proud of it, and you know, got to have a lot of fun as well. So, so that evening that you talked about when they showed the Day of the Doctor, um, there was a screening um, at the BFI um, at, in on the mm. South Bank, and I got to go and be part of that. So that that was uh, very enjoyable. Um, so you know, it was a lot of fun as well, uh, but mm. a lot of hard work, and nothing, nothing beats seeing Doctor Who fans uh, enjoying that kind of interaction. Uh, it, yeah. it really is wonderful to watch and just to see their face. You're walking along with uh, you know, hmm. whoever, Tom Baker or, or you know, Sylvester McCoy, and you can see their eyes. They're just so excited. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. one of my favourite memories is is going to a school with Matt Smith. I think the school had won some sort of competition, the script to screen mm. competition and stuff. And we kept a secret. They were, they were having an assembly where they knew it was going to be talked about. And just bringing Matt Smith into that was just, uh, you know, fantastic. Can you imagine uh, that? So yeah. <laughs> that's what it's all about. And, and you know, yeah. I, I, I don't want to overemphasize the online side of it or, or the, the, the sense that fans have of, of ownership. But it's it doesn't matter at all when you've got that as a payoff. It's just yeah. a wonderful yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. yeah. And and of course, for those kids, that's a lifelong memory, isn't it? They will always oh, yeah. remember when Matt Smith mm-hmm. joined their school assembly and they'll tell their kids about it, their grandkids and all that sort of thing. It's, well, it's you amazing. see, I always remember at the 20th anniversary at Longleat, mm. uh, yeah. it was a massive queue. I don't know if you remember, but there was, it was massively oversubscribed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My parents didn't come. They sort of stayed in the grounds and let me queue, etc. I don't think they mm. knew how long it was going to be. And uh, <laughs> I thought you'd be gone time. for an hour or so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. the waiting crowds peter davison came past in bessie and of course yeah crowd. and uh he but he didn't he wasn't near me so i had to make a choice to mm. leave the queue to go and see him so i did i was on my own i was, <gasps> oh, I was 13 and i left the queue yeah. and i went and it, there was loads of kids there and he shook their hands and stuff like that i took a photo and he completely ignored me completely you know <laughs> and then they went off so i had to get back in the queue and i was like half an hour behind and stuff uh, oh so no! I have told him about that since. <laughs> yeah, I should hope you have. He's deeply, deeply apologetic about it. So. Did I? Oh, I'm so sorry. I can imagine he'd be really polite about it as well. And <laughs> um, when we were at the fiftieth, we were queuing to meet Matt, <clears throat> and Sylvester, Peter, and Colin walked past in, in this this queue, and everyone said hello, you know, and, and sort of thing. And Colin stopped, and he he said to me. Uh, you know, in, in that voice, he's well, well, you know, what are you, what are you waiting here for? I said, oh, we're just about to go in and, and meet Matt. I said, would you like to come with us? And he, he, he laughed and he, he said, oh, you know, I've got to be somewhere. I think they had their, their talk to go to or something. So it was only a tiny little 
moment. I should have talked, we spoke to him uh, a year ago. You should have reminded him of it, Jeff. Yes, yeah. yeah. very you know, remiss. You, you could have joined in the photo, but uh, yeah, just <laughs> it was so exciting seeing them walk by like that and just having that, that brief in, interaction. It was just those yeah, little yeah. moments, isn't it? You know, meeting the doctor and to be able yeah. to be a part of making that happen, that must be really special. Yeah, and I think it doesn't matter how old you are when something like that happens. You know, it's, it's quite it's, right. It, it's well, look at you with Jody a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, we know? went to the con in uh, London and, and met Jody because I was going to say it was a real shame that there hasn't been any big events, you know, like uh, you know the fiftieth or anything since. And I kind of hope they do a sixtieth one, but you know, it's time and money and all of that, I guess. You know, and and things are, uh, you know, not quite the way they were back then in terms of you know, resources and all that, yeah, I guess. I mean, but yeah, I haven't ruled yeah. out. I mean, I, I've no inside information, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if there isn't mm. something again in the future. Um, it's really funny. I, I, you're sparking memories of that, that Excel hmm. uh, um, uh, convention. We didn't call it a convention. I think we were avoiding that name. Uh, uh, mm. but yeah, it was celebration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Celebration, yes. And then the one mm. that happened... Two years later, was it? Or a yeah. year later for, with Peter Capaldi's doctor. Mm. One thing I really remember about that is uh, it was the Thursday night at XL, and I think it started on the Friday. <clears throat> and there'd been some bomb attack in Paris. Uh, mm. And as such, uh, everywhere in London was on high alert. And yeah. uh, it just little things like, for example, Danny, Danny Hargreaves was going to do a controlled explosion at one point. Oh, yeah. That. So all, mm. all these little things that, you know, <laughs> uh, I, when people ask what, what it was, my involvement on that kind of stuff, it could have been anything from pushing a Dalek onto stage to sort of having to deal with yeah. re reorganizing a whole exhibition area because of that kind of eventuality. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, lo lots of memories. So just talking to you, they're all sort of slowly coming back now. <laughs> yeah. Talking about memories, what was it like going to Buckingham Palace? Oh, it's, it, I, I thought of that when you mentioned about the 50th, because I think it's mm. kind of forgotten about. But we did take um, a bevy of Doctor Who people to <clears throat> Buckingham Palace a few days before the mm. anniversary itself. Uh, Tom Baker was there, John Hurt was there, and a couple of writers and, and other people involved as well. We met uh, Sophie Wessex, Edward's uh, wife. Uh, she was the royal that we met. I mean, that was great. And that required a bit of planning. We'd been backwards and forwards doing recce, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, just working out what how what form it would take, and yeah. and uh, I can remember me and my colleague James sort of being you, you coming through Buckingham Palace at the back back entrance as it were, or side entrance. Uh, it's not easy to get in, but then you sort of had to go to one room to another. <laughs> and we we were walking down this corridor, and it was the staff quarters, yeah. and we just noticed there was a, a cash machine, but it was a coots cash machine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did, it, did it only dispense a hundred pound notes? Yeah, it dispensed it diamonds. Uh, and I just remember going to pop into the loo at one point and then thinking, shall I keep some of the toilet paper so I can say I've got Buckingham Palace toilet paper? Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think I it was would, just the same I'd as... I'd smuggle that out. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, take a whole exactly. roll, yeah. yeah. So, so that then was, they, that that's was, why they'd never let me in. Yeah, that was great. And that was only a few months after we'd um, uh, had uh, the King, then Prince Charles, mm. come and visit us at Rough Lock as well. So that was, you know, one of the exciting things, one of the many exciting things that happened in the 50th uh, mm. year. Uh, and it just showed how big Doctor Who was at that point, that, you know, that kind of thing, that kind of connection was happening. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, really fantastic. So, yeah, going to Buckingham Palace was brilliant. And, uh, <laughs> lots of lots of great <laughs> memories. Yeah, that's amazing. And then sort of things got a, a bit bigger again, yeah, after that, didn't they, with, with Peter and Jenna's worldwide tour? That... that was Brazil and Australia and New York yeah. maybe? And... Well, I didn't, I see, this is a sore point. No, it's not a sore point as such. What happened <laughs> is, uh, so this was managed by the, by what was then BBC Worldwide, which was the commercial arm. And yeah. so uh, they, they did all of that sort of, we, I think we did a, a massive screening in Cardiff, which again, my colleague Beth uh, organized and I was part of that, where mm. we sort of shut down the city centre. And then, um, then we took them up to London for another BFI screening. And that's it. They went off then. They went on planes and, and went around the whole mm. world. Where it's a sore subject is I had to be the contact um, on the ground with the production team that did all the approvals. Right. So anything like photos or, or video interviews or anything like that had to be approved before it went out. And there was an ongoing sort of documentary being made as well, I think, for online or or DVDX or something. I had to see yeah. versions of this. But that meant that I had to be on the same time 
frame timeline mm. as as Hill yeah. people. So yeah. I <clears throat> I stayed in Cardiff, but I got jet lag because I was uh, you know <laughs> something uh, as if I was traveling around the world. And I, you know, I so you got all the pain, but none of the gain. I did, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so yes. <laughs> So yes, and I, so jet, you don't have to travel to get jet lag. So I, mm. I yeah, that. I hadn't thought about that before. To start yeah. your body clock to those hours, yeah. and, and and that's it. <laughs> yeah. So you just mentioned about doing uh, approval and, and that on all, all the photos, and I know you were very involved with a lot of the photography for the show. So so how how does all that work? Do you do a kind of a list of the sort of you know poses and shots you want from you know cast and actors, or do you let the <laughs> You know how, how much control is in there, and, and are there tons of photos that we have yet to see of, uh-huh. of the doctors, or do you take you know the hundred that are taken, for example, and bin ninety of them and, and pick? Tevis, so, do sorry, carry on. I'm, I was going <laughs> to stop now, Jeff. Yeah, Let him answer the question. <laughs> uh, answer the question. Ask the question. Don't give the answers. Uh, yeah, so so what happens is uh, you know there's there's two t- types of photography or three types really. There's there's what's called unit photography, which is the onset stuff of what you see in the mm. so you know kind of like an elaborate still. Uh, then there's the uh, the setup photography, which tends to be about against white screen, and that tends to be of characters. Yeah. And I'll come a bit more to that. And then you've got what the BBC terms um, iconic photos, which is an icon for a particular episode or yeah. series. Uh, mm. People misinterpret that word when they say an iconic photo and think iconic in, in, in the sense we tend to use it, but it literally means that's the that's the the, the symbol. Um, and you know, yeah, every, yeah, every, like every icon year, in the old-fashioned sense. Exactly, well, an example yes. is um, Peter and Jenna running, isn't it, with the the explosion behind uh, them and stuff, and, and still hanging yes. out of the TARDIS. Yes, that that was a great one, and that was kind of an echo of one of, of Martha and the Tenth Doctor running with an explosion. Mm. Um, I remember that shoot yeah. particularly well because I remember we had a springboard. <laughs> so they were shot against green. I mean, a springboard right. that they had to, to to jump on and they weren't in camera at the same time. Uh, but yeah, lo- lots of fun uh, with, with that <laughs> one. Uh, and so, so yes, the, the white screen photography, the unit photography happens during, you know, shooting. The white screen photography tends to happen whenever there's an opportunity. So there'll be a cameraman on set with lights and, and a white screen and he'll, he yeah. knows that, uh, you have to do for characters for for merchandise or for magazines and stuff. The Sycorax, for example, you have to have them, you know, in uh, every angle and doing a few poses yeah. and, and 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 so on and so forth. Uh, and so that's captured. And actually, if it gets to the end of the series and they don't have enough Cybermen poses, um, and maybe they're missing some Sontaran ones, then there may be a separate photo show set up <clears throat> where all that stuff is wrapped up. Um, and then mm. the the iconic photography or the generic photo photography, as it's also known, happens to be a concept that's been approved and agreed, uh, yeah. and and then is specifically shot. Mm. That tends to have happened at the end of the series because that's when we've got an idea what the whole series is about. Wow, um, interesting. And my involvement in that was would, would vary. There was a photography manager uh, who who looked after that, and in the last few years. A wonderful lady, the last few years that I was there, a wonderful lady called Christine. I worked very closely with her. I really enjoyed uh, working with her. And she would come up with concepts and that would go through a series of approval and then we would shoot it. Yeah. Um, uh, and sometimes some of the concepts were mine, which I was always very proud of when, when that happened. <clears throat> one that I particularly liked is the one with um, Matt Lucas and uh, Pearl Mackey uh, with Peter Cavalli's where... Uh, the doctor is there with the TARDIS door open and they're in mid space and, and Nardole is holding on to him and he's holding on to Bill who's hanging yeah. out. That was a concept that I came yeah, up with. So, yeah. so I was <laughs> particularly fond of that one. Uh, yeah, so yeah. It's a, it's a great image. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good one, isn't it? And um, so, yeah, of course there's lots of photog- photos taken that don't go out there because somebody has got an, an eye closed or, you know, or, or is gurning or it's just not a great picture, or it's a bit blurred, or that kind of stuff. But, mm. you know, actors get get a say as well. They, they they get to say, oh, I don't like that picture of me. And, you know, and once the other actors said that... Yeah, as well, I guess they got a stake in it, they, they, You know, I guess. But there, there isn't, like, amazing stuff that's that's not been seen, as far as I'm aware. It's just, you know, maybe a slight, slight old, you know, d- different version of something maybe has yeah. gone and, and will probably never see the light of day. Uh but I wouldn't worry about that too much. One recollection yeah, I've got, no. um, which yeah. uh, is something that you, I think fans will appreciate, is when we 
announced Peter Capaldi's costume uh, uh, for the first time, and it's that photo I think oh, yeah. <laughs> where he's doing something like oh, that. He's, he's, he's got the hand yeah, down. He's got his hand out. It's the it? magician, yeah. the Doctor Mysterio uh, pose, or, or what have you. And we'd taken a lot of photos, and there was a few to choose from. That was one of them. And nobody could decide which one. And someone turned <laughs> to me and said, all right, Edward, which one should we go with? And I came up with this really silly idea. The file number of that one was 1967.jpg. And I said, <laughs> 1967 is the year where there are most missing episodes of Doctor Who. So let's choose that one. <laughs> so that was the reason that that image with the handout it, it got used. I think Peter was slightly Brilliant. annoyed by that because he kept having to do that pose every time somebody wanted to do a picture. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe rub uh, some of the magic so, of being the Doctor off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's talk- a real vanish thing that happened. Yeah. yeah. We talked to uh, James Pardon, photographer, mm. uh, a while ago. Um, I think he did some stuff in, in, in your time on the show and a lot with, with Jody. And I said, oh, there was a picture of Jody on the cover of DWM, and uh, it's, it's one of my favourite shots of her. And uh, he said, yeah, the, the, the body was mine, but the head was from another photo shoot that someone else did, and they've been comped together. And I said, Really? I couldn't tell at all. It was seamless on it. So I was like, well, I, I like part of the photo then. <laughs> well, th- there's an interesting story there. So um, Matt appeared on the cover of Entertainment Weekly in America. And Entertainment Week- Weekly is a huge magazine over in the States. Mm. To get him on the cover, I think this is in 2010, possibly, uh, was, it was a really big deal. It was a big deal, yeah. And uh, they had various options of photos to choose from. And he was holding the Sonic. But and this is difficult for us to appreciate now, but the, the Sonic was quite recognisably the Sonic for the British audience. We know what it is, but it didn't quite read yeah. for, for the overseas. They didn't, they were, what is that? What is it going on? Okay. Mm. And there wasn't the right version. Mm. <clears throat> it needed to be something that was kind of uh, <laughs> upright so you could see the, the Sonic with the light at the end of it. So what we did is we retook uh, that particular part of the photo, and that's my hand. So I put on Matt's jacket, <laughs> held the Sonic in various poses until we got one that they were happy, and then that was uh, matted on to the picture of Matt. So uh, it's one of the uh, you know the biggest magazines in the world, and uh, it's my hand has been on that. It was uh, your hand. So, so you, you're part, part doctor, then uh, you know, part, you've yeah, yeah. Doctor by, on, by on generation, cover. yes. Yeah, and I, this story yeah. must have got out. <laughs> this story must have got out in some way. I can't remember, but I was at a convention yeah. uh, many years ago now. But uh, somebody was there with that magazine and asked me to sign it, which I was very, very flattered. <laughs> Maybe feel slightly famous for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A ha- yes. Model uh, career Beckham. That, that, that's a story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you mentioned um, 1967, mm. then, and that, that's the year of most lost episodes. So you were involved in, in the sort of recovery of some lost episodes, weren't you, around the time of the 50th and Enemy um, of the World and stuff? Well, not really involved, but, you know, aware of it. It was all very top secret because it was all managed mm. in, in a certain way. Uh, I mean, the only thing to really say about that, uh, uh, and the only thing I would say is all these rumours of all these episodes that came back that were then you know, not didn't come back or that there were screenings of the power of the Daleks and all this kind of stuff. It's yeah. absolute rubbish. It really all, is. And I have got yeah. nobody to protect by saying that. It's what what we got back is what was there to come back. Mm. And, I, you know, I don't care if you do manage to speak to uh, Gareth Roberts, his next door neighbour's mum, who once uh, <laughs> uh, shared a cab with Patrick Troughton. It's it's just not not true at all. And I I wasn't mm. I was aware of these things happen, but it was all very top secret at the same time. So I, you know my involvement mm. was, was minimal. But I'm I, I am telling people if they if you know if they don't want to believe it, they won't believe it anyway. There are no other episodes that were part of that package that didn't come back. It just yeah, didn't if if. If there were, what what benefit is there to, to keeping them back? I mean, you know, maybe yeah. there's other stuff out there in the world still somewhere. You know, yeah. there's, there's always a, a rumour about that. But, yeah, if the BBC yeah. has got stuff... Uh, I really hope something goes else... goes out. Yeah. yeah. I really hope something else comes back at some point. I think, you know, the mm. window of, of that mm. happening and, and of it being of good quality by the time it does come back is, is quite small. But, it's probably quite uh, narrow now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, mm. it, it, indeed. But, uh, but yeah, so... so you know, I was I was aware of various things, but also not involved because it was quite important. Not, not, it was kept yeah. top secret because, uh, and it was kept top secret because I think there were issues around the recovery of of where these things came from. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's nothing more yeah. um, 
salacious than that involved. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in in a moment, I'll ask you a bit more about your, your post who work, but I just wondered if you had a personal highlight from your time on the show that that you could share with us. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, it's, and it's the the one moment that I kind of got had a tiny bit of influence on the on the, the actual show itself. Oh yes. And yeah. uh, I, I'm sure uh, anyone who knows me will be laughing that and saying, "Of course, he brings up this story. This is the most exciting thing that ever happened, <laughs> is, happened in his life." But uh, you know, I am responsible for Kylie Minogue being on Doctor Who. Uh, so, wow. Yes. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? I am, Fantastic. I, that is pretty cool. That's a yeah. brilliant claim to fame right there. Yeah, I'm the instigator. So what happened there is uh, I, I'm friends with William Baker, who was at the time her stylist and, and close friend. We'd been at the right. launch of, of Martha's series, series three uh, in London. And I think there was a couple of glasses of red wine and we were chatting. And, and <laughs> one of us said, wouldn't it be funny if Kylie was on Doctor Who? And, and <laughs> if you remember, Kylie had been very ill in the naughty. She'd had breast cancer um, and of recovered from mm. it at this point and, uh, you know, was making her way back out. Um, and uh, uh, during the, you know, a, a few more glasses of wine later, I think we, we'd gone over to Russell and Julie and said, how about Kylie's in Doctor Who? And they said, well, if she wants to do it, that, that's fine. The next day, I got a call from Will to say, well, I'm seeing Kylie this weekend and, you know, can you send me The Runaway Bride, which is the most recent Christmas episode then, yeah. uh, and, I'll, and I'll show it to her. And I kind of like the idea of, of, of Kylie Minogue coming up with her best friend on a Sunday on the sofa and watching uh, uh, Dog Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I did send the disc and, uh, yeah, things cascaded from there and Russell's talked about it in his book where they went to meet her and mm. stuff and, talked about writing the script so that was my little bit uh and i'm pretty sure oh, yeah. it may never have happened if i hadn't had that slightly inebriated yeah with with will yeah. but yeah as a consequence i got to be on set i was you know i would visit set quite often but mm. very rarely always be on set and i got to be on set most of the time that kylie was there because uh, uh will was her photographer wanted a lot of assistance because he wasn't used to being on set there was a lot of protection that needed to be done around secrecy and stuff like that so I got to be on set most days with Kylie. And that was great because I'm a, a fan and yeah. to work alongside her was, was great. <clears throat> but kind of a bit scary as well because, not hmm. scary, I didn't want to let on how much of a fan I was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know how it is. You want to be a bit casual. Yeah. Uh, or so when you met her, did you say, so t tell me about yourself. What do you yeah. do? Yeah. <laughs> not, not quite. Are you new to acting? No, not, not, not far off. Uh, and I, I'm sure that Will had already told her, oh, he's a massive fan or what have you. I might have yeah, wanted yeah, to talk yeah. to her about a three inch CD single from Japan from 1974. Or <laughs> but, I did. but I do remember, I can remember one or two instances where we were chatting and it, you know, it was fine. There was a couple of times when we were chatting and I was like, this is surreal. And she might have been part, imparting something, you know, personal to me or something and rather than going yeah. oh my god that's amazing Kylie thank you for that I would have been just sort of like oh, yeah whatever uh, yeah <laughs> probably a bit too cool uh, but I'm sure she's yeah yeah I think before. but that was great and we had a you know great involvement with her with the episode that was the when I, then went on to be the biggest mm. ever episode of, of the modern, yes. of modern times uh it was also the launch of iPlayer against that and, yeah uh you know a great great time I remember we then saw Kylie the following summer, um, mm. it was the same day as the prom because uh, we'd done the prom on the Sunday, I think, or maybe it was the Saturday. And then a group of us went to see Kylie at the O2 where she was performing that night. Uh, and we watched her concert. And then when I say group of us, it was people like Russell and Julie and, uh, and yeah. so on and so forth. And we went backstage and we had to go through a series of parties before we got to Kylie's <laughs> party. Uh, and uh, yeah, then we were in this little room with Kylie in, in a disco in a silver dress with a disco ball. Uh, uh, and that was the last time I saw her. I remember saying to her, oh, I'll see you, I'll see you. And she sort of said, I'll see you around, as if to say, that's it. <laughs> you yeah. <know> <laughs> and uh, apart from on the stage, where she's been on the stage, I've not seen her since. But that, that, was, right. that was very exciting. And, you know, it's brilliant that's what really I did cool. for the show. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, getting her in was a, a big coup, wasn't it? It was. It a, was, yeah. A yeah. Really big thing, yeah. 
I remember someone saying to me they, they'd heard a rumour that Kylie was coming in uh, Doctor mm. Who, and I said, no, don't be silly. That'll never <laughs> happen. And then, obviously, it did. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we got you to thank for that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, since you moved on from the show, you, you've been script supervisor on a number of things, haven't you, yeah. as well? So, t- tell us a little I've, bit about that. I've done a few things. I sort of left... Uh, so, my job came to an end because of the mm. way that BBC Worldwide and BBC merged into BBC Studios. So, I hung around a bit mm. and then mm. uh, that job went. So, uh, you know, as I'm sure you're familiar with what can happen is when you make redundancy, you can stay and do another job or you can choose to leave and take uh, redundancy, which yeah. you chose to do. I've been at BBC for 18, 17 years. So mm, I thought it was the yeah. right time to sort of uh, move on. Uh, also, you don't want to, you know, I, I I wouldn't want to do another job on Doctor Who at, at the time or work somewhere else and still be sort of, it's a bit like uh, splitting up with your partner but living in the same uh, building. <laughs> it's kind of, you, know, you, you, you don't want to do that. Uh, I did a few things and one of them was uh, as a producer role working on a, um, a Wallace and Cromit uh, show, uh, sort of, sort of, um, device, as it were, I yeah. really enjoyed that. And I, but I decided what I really wanted to do was make TV. That's what I hadn't done on Doctor Who, but what I was really interested yeah. in producing uh, was was where I uh, I felt I was headed, uh, and I need more on floor experience of, of what it's like. So the script supervisor role is something I trained to do. A script supervisor, a bit like brand manager, it's one of those things you always have to explain because nobody knows, but it's kind of essential. Mm. You, you sit with the director, uh, you know the, the script fully, and it's your job to work with the director to make sure what's on page ends up what in the can for everything in it. So that's all the things like the continuity. So to make sure when you go again and again that you know they take the sip at the same time, that they, they've got their scarf on when they leave that scene, but you shot the other scene earlier, yeah. that kind of stuff. But also to work with the actors to make sure all the dialogue gets across. Um, to work with the director as well to make sure that the camera angles make sense or, you know, where it's said in the script that they, they're... You're not there for performance, but if you think a certain beat yeah. isn't captured, sort of you work with the director, do you think we've got that kind of stuff? And all the logging. It's a job I really, really like because it's one of those things that's essential and it connects with all the other departments as well. Yeah, uh, you've got a lot of... Uh you know in, not influence as such but, but you're well, involved I mean, you, in a lot of yeah, different areas I mean, not there is an influence and it's a bit like the role yeah. of doctor who really because you kind of connect mm. with everybody and uh it couldn't really happen it could happen without you but it wouldn't be as good it'd be a lot of uh, hard yeah. work yeah <laughs> you know, it's the sort of role where if if you're not there that's when things yeah. start Become to some, go yeah and fall apart schedule. yeah oh yeah yeah. yeah uh yeah yeah definitely uh i, I like things like that um, and so I've been doing that for a few years and I've really enjoyed it. I've done a lot on Casualty, which is shot where Doc 2 was shot in Rothlock. That's kind of yeah, red yeah. But I've been doing some bigger shows and I've also started from that, uh, from the show I did back in the summer, I did some directing. So the second unit. <laughs> so, uh, so I got to, you know, when we were shooting more stuff, the director would send me off to direct that stuff. And I think I've come to the Fantastic. that's what I want yeah. to do next, uh, rather than produce producing yeah but i think directing mm. so so that's where my head is at the moment i want i want to be a director so okay. i'm sort of now sort of trying to get my own short film off the ground and and carry on script supervising because i really like it really really like it um uh, yeah. it's a job where you get to be a bit of a pedant you get to tell somebody they did something wrong uh, <laughs> but in a really nice yeah. way <laughs> yeah yeah, like, yeah. Uh, uh, um but yes so, so that's what i do now and i do other things as well i keep myself busy um uh, and it's been really interesting also, you know, to, to really be a Doctor Who fan now in a way that I haven't been because mm. you know, from that from that first series onwards when I was getting to see some, I mean, I mean the Christopher Eccleston series, I was getting to see some stuff in advance, uh, you know, for a very long time, I, I was very much in the know of what was happening and now I don't know anything. Mm, yeah. I, I sort of disconnected with the show in recent years because I've been doing other stuff, but I'm very much on board with what Russell and Pad Wolf are doing now. I've loved everything I've seen. I'm so excited for Shooty's first full series. Uh, yeah, we're we're looking forward to it. So you you have no idea where that's going to go, what's going to happen outside of what we all know. Or and I know. Do you have some nothing. little I mean, insight? Even, even if I did know anything, I wouldn't mm. say that I knew anything. So uh, no. I mean, <laughs> no, I wasn't asking that, Edward. <laughs> Honestly, the thought never when, crossed when, my mind. When we stopped recording, you. you... <laughs> well, no, no, I, I, I don't. I, mean, I was just going to. Because I'm part of crew, TV crew uh, in, in Wales, you hear stuff like, oh, they're shooting mm. something this weekend, mm. Doctor Who, that kind of stuff. So, they, you know, I do know little things, but not, not anything real. That I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know anything really. So, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. 
Which is quite good, though, isn't it? As a fan, that's yeah, kind of what you want. Back. You want to get as close it. to that, I don't you? Yeah. People, mm. can, people sometimes say to me, oh, would you go back to Doctor? And the, and the answer is, is no. I mean, I, there isn't an opportunity anyway. Maybe in, maybe mm. it's something else, maybe a script supervisor or you know, yeah. something I'll ever be a good enough director to do it. But maybe in some of the <laughs> But I wouldn't go back to uh, what I did before. Um, mm. Yeah, because you've done that, right? It's, yeah, yeah, it's a completed journey. Yeah, it's, mm. it's not yeah, something yeah. I don't think I could add anything to it. Uh, so, so now to properly be a fan once again for the first time in yeah. a very long time is is really exhilarating, and it's and I, uh, I love it. I really, really love it. It's giving me the same yeah. excitement. That's that what I had, you know when I was a lot younger. Yeah, Chris That's what, I was just going to say that yeah. it did, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, Chris said uh, he said to Russell, "Don't tell me anything. I don't want to yeah. know anything. I just want to watch it." You know, mm. it comes out. I was um, I was going to ask when yeah. you would. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I, I did get one very lucky opportunity oh. on the on the 60th anniversary mm. on, that's just passed the 23rd of uh, November. I got to watch the 60th anniversary episode in advance because I did a screening in one of my capacities. I, I look after RTS Royal Television Society here in Wales. We did a screening of that, yes, uh, yeah. with, with Russell in attendance. So I got to watch that episode sat next to Russell T Davis two days before everybody. Yeah, that's else. pretty good. Uh, that's cool. Nice. That, and that was that was kind of. I don't want to say healing because there's not been nothing to heal, but in terms of uh, it was mm. real sort of like, oh yeah, I feel back. This is it now. Yeah, this is, this yeah. Is yeah, that's nice. Complete the circle a kind of thing. And it is a bit like a when you did a job for a long time <laughs> and you've been very involved. It is a bit like a breakup with somebody, even though you've yeah. chosen to split up with them. It yeah. still feels a bit strange, but uh, but we're, we're on. Yeah, it's been so much a part of your life for so long <laughs> yeah, to yeah. to change that you yeah. know, that that relationship. Yeah, it's it's must be odd. Yeah, yeah. and I was going to ask, what you did some work on Casualty. Was Pete Levy producing them? We, we oh, lovely we Pete, Pete Levy. Yes, I worked with him. He was great, really good. Yeah. Have you chatted? With He's him? a diamond, isn't he? Oh, a yeah, uh, and um, I, I run a little film festival as well, and he was one of the judges on last year's event oh, for us. Excellent. So uh, he, he came to the uh, awards night in December and stuff. Oh, so uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Um, mm. And um, yeah, he's just a, he's a really nice Top guy. He's been, mm. Yeah, he's been oh. ages talking to my dad actually on the night. <laughs> yeah, so, like, similar areas of the world. Um, they were in the bar um, in the corner of the bar, weren't they? Yeah, for ages, yeah, they just were, chatting yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he's he's a he's a great guy. Yeah, big really fan nice. of Pete. Yeah, very big fan of Pete. Yeah. Um, so tell us briefly about your Royal Television uh, Society stuff there in Wales, because you're on the committee there, aren't you? So, yeah, I, I chair the committee here in Wales. So basically, mm. uh, RTS, uh, you might be aware of, it's a bit like BAFTA, I guess, uh, but much more TV-focused, whereas BAFTA is film as well. Uh, it's an organisation that's been running for, gosh, 70 years, I think, uh, over 60 years in Wales. And it's, it's, it's a, I suppose it's a voluntary thing. I, yeah, more or less voluntary. And we put on events. Uh, the events mm. are to educate people in, in in TV, so we get to do screenings and then have panels afterwards. So we just most recently did something for the Winter King, which is another Bad Wolf series. We put on a screening in, in here in Cardiff. I had a panel with the cast and crew afterwards. Yes, we got to do that for Doctor for the fiftieth. Um, I'm currently working on another screening uh, for something that's going to come up. So this is something that I sort of do in my own time, um, and, and I really enjoy it. I love. Uh, it's kind of allows me to tick the box of some of the stuff I did on Doctor Who, I guess, really, which is to mm. connect with audiences mm. and and uh, to put on screenings and events. Uh, so it keeps me ticking over and that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, yeah, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, and I, I I will I've done it for about four or five years. I'll I'll do it for a little bit more. We put on a bigger awards event uh, every year. And there's one coming up in April. I think that might be it. Then I think it takes up a lot of your time. Uh, yeah, um, as an honorary role, so you need to sort of like think about what you're going to do next. But it's something I've really, really enjoyed. Definitely, yeah, that's great. And um, you, you're a fellow podcaster as well, aren't you? Yes, yes, I am a podcaster. So back in lockdown, probably about a week into lockdown, like quite lots of other people, I thought, oh, let's try a podcast. Uh, and it was extremely. That's, that's <laughs> what we said, wasn't well, it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's yeah. thought as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 uh, I mentioned at one point. Uh, as, as well as Kylie Minogue, I'm a big fan of Madonna growing up, huge, huge fan of Madonna. Mm. Uh, and uh, mm. to the point where, in a bit like my fandom knowledge of Doctor Who, I sort of understood everything about the recording of her music and the, and the writing and stuff like that. So I did a podcast mm. that, um, called Inside the Groove, which took each song and told the story of how it was made and sort of like, you know, 
Oh, this, so to the point where it's quite detailed, sort of this song uses this drum machine, which was invented in 1979 and is also used on this <laughs> record and that kind of stuff and giving examples. That sounds really boring, but trying to do it in a more, much more interesting way. And part, <laughs> partly, because of lockdown, <laughs> partly because of lockdown and partly because I think it was a bit of a niche. Um, mm. uh, it became really popular. There's similar um, podcasts, I think, called Sonic Song Exploder and stuff like that, which do that generally. But this one was just for Madonna. And it's in yeah, one of the yeah. episodes, uh, and it's had it's coming up to coming up to a million downloads in total. Wow. At various points, it was in the top ten for music podcasts. Uh, on That's iTunes. fantastic, so isn't it? It was re- really, really mm. popular at certain points. Uh, and I also then turned it into a live experience. So we had a few live events. We had about four or five in London where we've gathered fans together, done yeah. a live episode on stage. Uh, so, so yeah, I kind of uh, got to do that. Uh, which was which was great. I really enjoyed it. Kind of happened by accident, but um, you know, it's it, uh, uh, it made me a bit of money, as I'm sure sometimes podcasts yeah. can. Uh, I would also allow yeah. me to connect with uh, various people, which is great. And uh, I'm Indeed, totally yeah. Gonna- Jonathan Madonna is aware of it. Uh, I don't know. I know she's aware of it. And when I said she <laughs> liked it, the person that told me, they said, well, you haven't been closed down. So to, that's as far as you're going to get with it. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah what, what you just said there, you know, the, the people we've met through mm. doing our podcast, you know, people like yourself who've, you know, been involved in the show and other fans and things like that is, it's, you know, one of the best things that have come yeah, out of it. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Really, Without a doubt. You know, uh, just brilliant, really. To, yeah. I I started doing it on my own, uh, but then some other people got involved. Someone who mm. is a photographer who could talk about the photography, and somebody who is a graphic designer could talk about that. And we've ended up becoming very close friends as well. And you know, they, mm. for nothing else, that it's it's been worth it for those those two friendships. Mm. And actually, there's other friendships along the way uh, that have happened. Yeah, uh, it, it's wonderful. Podcasts yeah. uh, are, are great for doing that. And yeah, I don't really listen to podcasts. Yeah. I've you know run a very successful one, but I don't really listen to them. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't. You've got time yeah. to do that sort of thing, haven't you? <laughs> you, you know, that, that's it. When you run one, you, you haven't got mm. the time. With, yeah, yeah. You know, Actually, I, I, too much others and yeah. I said I listened to this one. I probably won't. I can't. I, I won't be able to listen to myself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll forgive you. Don't worry about that. That's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I mean, we were talking a, 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 a little while ago about uh, some of the negative aspects of fandom, but actually podcasting is something that tends to bring fans together, not just mm-hmm. in the actual show itself, but I mean, certainly online where we've got, uh, you know, we kind of established an, a really positive community yeah. of, you know, like-minded fans and people who follow what, what we do and who contribute stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and it's really nice to see. And I don't think... You know, in a way, we wouldn't have been able to grow this show or develop that community without the power of social media. So yeah. as well as the negative stuff, there's a lot of really good positive stuff that comes out of it. Yeah. And, and we, we made it clear from the outset that, you know, we love Doctor Who and, and we want to see Yeah, we're not going to trash and, it, yeah, <laughs> really. That's not our know, thing. We'll never do a Who's Your Worst Doctor episode. Mm. And, I, and like Paul just said, I think the the audience that we've got feel very similar. And, uh, you know, we, we get there's no sort of negativity in it in any of the stuff that we do and you know it's it's opened up you know some wonderful doors with with people from the Mm. show and well i think and other fans and stuff and that's a really good mentality to have and it's kind of something similar i do with the madonna one but i think there are Mm. uh there are certain people that can only accept positive and stuff i certainly get this with madonna so uh if you want to be a bit humorous or a bit realistic about something and uh you know, you might want to say, for example, the time lash is not really the best on two story. Or you might want to say would that, never uh, say that because uh, you know uh, why because it's the best Doctor Who story. Right. Okay. <laughs> so you're wrong <laughs> there, Edward, for a start, mate. <laughs> okay. So if I might want to say that Shanghai Surprise is a terrible, I know what you mean. Uh, though. Uh, and then suddenly there are certain elements that that say you're mm. a hater, you're a trasher, this is terrible. And then well, you, you, I'm sure you've seen it. Just say absolutely awful things about you. And I think part of being a fan is seeing the the shade and the light. And I think you you yeah. know there are bits of Doctor Who that aren't as good as others, but uh, only by having those bits that aren't as good are the bits that are good better. Yeah. And you know, and, that, and yeah. I think uh, being a fan doesn't mean you have to love everything. It doesn't mean you have to trash stuff you don't love. But I think no. recognizing the good and the bad is is part of the fun. Oh, absolutely. And doing it yeah. Again, yeah. Actually. Mm. Uh, yes. you know. Yeah, and and th- there's a there's a way to, you know, you you can criticize without 
tearing stuff and without apart. without it getting personal as well which yeah. again we were talking about earlier isn't yeah. it you know yeah. if i because I, I think you know when if, if some somebody jumps on i mean we've we, we've had a few sort of controversial or where we've tackled controversial subjects in doctor who and we have had pylons on twitter and stuff like that and what tends to happen is that somebody will come and make something personal and then suddenly get a get a huge reaction from you know our kind of more dedicated and more like-minded followers and then it gets even more personal and then it becomes really something which is quite nasty and which mm. sort of bursts the kind of safe space that we want you, you know you, you're right discussion is is great but there's there's an element where if somebody's attacking something in a certain way it becomes an attack on that person because they like that episode or whatever it is because it means something really personal to them you know so whether it's a time in their lives something they were going through and then somebody jumps in from their armchair takes that apart makes it personal and then it becomes you know becomes quite nasty so i think when we've tried to look at shows that we you know we we've done these battle royales haven't we jeff where you like a show and i'm not so keen on it or whatever yeah. but you know we'll have those things but always try and just kind of measure it as well and present it as objectively as far as you can anyway as you know as, yeah. as possible yeah, yeah I think we've, we've got a i think you have to remember that in order to be brilliant as doctor who is in mm. where, whatever it does whether it's a tv episode or whether it's a book or a piece of merchandise mm. it has to try different things and not everything will work yeah exactly like we were saying earlier wasn't it yeah mm. yeah and you know yeah. people could pick apart things that we did as part of the the, the, the merchandise or the, or the branding or the marketing <clears throat> and say that was a terrible thing they did. Oh, how embarrassing and stuff. I, I'm trying to think of something now, but something that... Uh, <laughs> it's about to be something. Uh, It'd be a version of the right, Sonic somewhere. Right, that the, probably the, wasn't the, quite um, right. The, the, the Mr. Potato Head or something like that. Uh, yeah, there you or, go. Or, you know, or something a bit bigger, something like... Um, uh, 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 anyway, the thing is, if it had worked, then it would be mm. genius. And actually, there are things yeah. that did. Were, were genius. The mm. sideman, the helmet changer, voice changer thing. That was yeah. a massive success. The, the the Dalek sec one was 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 not a success. But uh, mm. if it had been a success, that would be genius as well. And so yeah. you know, it's and it's like it with a pop star with their music as well. You know, if they they've got to keep trying new stuff, as we were saying earlier, yes. you've got to keep going after the now, and yeah. and not everything will stick. Um, yeah, mm. that, that one thing will still be somebody's favorite, and you've got to be respectful. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's, that's what yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, that you know, someone else's worst episode is someone else's mm. favorite, and yeah, yeah. It's, uh, exactly. Know, it's just, it's all it. subjective, really, isn't mm. it? Unless there's a hard commercial line somewhere, then somebody's Absolutely. always going to enjoy it. They're going to well, love that thing. It's going to mean something. To, to, to echo them. what we said earlier on, I'm sure Time Nash is Colin Baker's favorite story. So there we go. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Edward, we've got a few questions from uh, followers on Twitter uh, to uh, fire at you to kind of uh, round things up for our chat. So, um, JTW on Twitter says, if you had to sum up Doctor Who in one mm. image, a piece of branding or, or key art, uh, or just a still frame from your time on the show, which which would it be? Oh, gosh. Uh I, I can think of something, and I don't want to say it because it's a repeat, but I, but I'll go with it because it's it's really powerful. And I think it's the um, it's the the Doctor and Companion running from an explosion. We did it twice. We did it with Martha and um, mm. Tenth Doctor, and we did it again with Jenna and Peter Capaldi's Doctor. And it just feels yeah. <clears throat> you've got best friends. <laughs> it's an adventure with a friend. I think that was a tagline yeah. that was used behind the scenes at one point, and they're holding hands or what have you, and they're they're running from something glorious and deadly and wonderful at the same time yeah. and any image that's kind of captured up that uh is is always something that i think really sums up uh my memories and also what the show can be about mm. yes yeah I, I i remember both those images uh, they were so good the, the peter one particularly it was so nicely done and so atmospheric and you know it kind of captured you know jenna's got a kind of excited smile on her face he's looking kind of ooh, mysterious and it, you know it's exciting and dangerous and all that it was just yeah great image can i, can I, can I just add to that actually just yes. just on that same thing for, for me the the equivalent image of that would be um and i wish wish they kind of stylize it in some way because it's really low res because the time it was at but is sylvester mccoy walking away from the exploding tent oh, in the great yeah. shona galaxy he doesn't yeah. run he doesn't reach out with his hand yeah he walks yeah and he doesn't flinch <laughs> and he, he didn't he, flinch either did he when they recorded that it was really close to him, mm. yeah. on him wasn't it? The, what the a star what a guy yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great image yeah <laughs> um 
So there's a question from Didymus Holmes on Twitter. Um, and he, he asked if you carried on watching the show after you left, but what would you have done differently for a promo during Jody's era? Because there was talk that there wasn't a brand manager in, in that time and, you know, things were, uh, you know, markedly different in the sort of promo and stuff. And I, and I think there was uh, difficulties really getting things done because of the changes behind the scenes and stuff like that with, you know, the, 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 the BBC studios and things like that. I don't mean, the, you know, Chris coming on and stuff like that. Yeah. My answer is I'm not going to answer that. That's really unfair. <laughs> uh, partly because I, I wasn't really sort of interacting with it. Um, so I couldn't mm. know. Um, also, that's, that, that would be a really unfair thing to do. Like if I go back to the analogy of it, like uh, splitting up with a partner, it's a bit like uh, giving notes on their new boyfriend and, and what I think they should do. Yes. So I, yeah. I, I would never do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, fair enough. That's, good, well that's, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ian Banks, uh, who's also on Twitter, he said, how did the focus of the marketing change over your time with the show and, and did the advent of social media affect the way things were done and how publicity was handled? Oh, gosh, that's such a broad question. I don't know if I can give a, mm. a particular answer. I, th I think something that um, isn't often talked about is <clears throat> is how the audience changed um, partly because of uh, the way the show matured when Matt became the Doctor and how mm. it then had a success in America and with Torchwood. Uh, so when, you know, those early David Tennant uh, and even Chris Eccleston periods, uh, there was definitely, it wasn't the only target, but there was a definite aim for pre-teens. Um, and then teens suddenly became interested in Doctor Who. They weren't in 2007. Mm. It was incredibly uncool. We would do visits to schools and uh, teenagers would roll their eyes when they'd see the targets of Daleks there. It was only like eight year olds <laughs> would be excited about it. But then, um, and this isn't something just unique to Doctor Who. I think the, the, there was a rise of the geek uh, in a way that had been really uncool when we were young. And yeah. uh, suddenly, uh, and even now, it's to be a geek and to be a whatever it is, a Marvel Comics fan or a Harry Potter fan or whatever it is you might be a fan of, is kind of cool and almost sexy in some ways. Mm. Yeah, you don't um, need to be embarrassed about it anymore. E exactly. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so that, that sort of changed. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's certainly something that's, that happened there. Um, I mean, social media has changed everything. So, so, so it's, it's a silly, mm. almost a moot point. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you make an announcement, you, you put it on social media because it then goes to everybody yeah. in a way that you, know, mm. you just couldn't reach people before. So obviously that, that had an effect uh, positive and negative. Uh, you know, I don't think, uh, I, I can't speak for now, but I would be very surprised if people are watching what's being said on Twitter and then feeding back because we never did. I mean, people were vaguely aware of it. I might have looked because I had a Twitter presence, but lots of people didn't. But if you, if everyone thinks like they're going, oh, yes, they didn't really like the Goblin song in, in the Christmas <laughs> Day episode, so that's not going to come back again. That, that mm. I would be very surprised if that happens. It certainly didn't happen in my so, time. Yeah. So, uh, so if you don't like the Goblin song, who cares? No one, no one's listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's always a misunderstanding in some way that that you know social media is is like a, a representative it's, of yeah. the wider thing. It's despite the numbers that are there, I think it's still a very small mm. fraction of of the whole. So you, yeah, I don't think you can take not, that as a right. representative sample. Yeah. Right. Definitely without a doubt. Um, there's a question from uh, Doctor Who Production News uh, on Twitter. Hmm. I wonder hmm. what happened to the book that you were writing. Yes. It was with Ob Obverse Books, was that right? Yes. I um, I was going to do a book and then COVID happened. Uh, I was going to do a book about my time and then COVID happened. So the book that I was going to write just wouldn't have been the same. Um, and I did mm. think I did carry on for a few years thinking, should I do it and sort of planning stuff? And it just wouldn't be the same because at the point when I would have had to deliver, I'd really wanted to meet up with old colleagues and go, do you remember this? And what happened then? You know, when we went to Buckingham mm. Palace, did we take the toilet paper and that kind mm. of stuff? And it just wasn't possible. I just, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and for many of us, as we all know, life just went in a very different way in COVID. And it comes mm. to a point where yeah. I, was, I was probably coming up to delivery and I sort of gave a long thought to it and thought, no, I'm not going to do it now. But a lot of it's in my head still, and maybe maybe one day I'll do it, or maybe it'll just come out maybe one day, these yeah. kind of things. Uh, well, but, uh, you've, uh, because... you've shared some stories with us today, which, uh, you know, will... I'm Might sure go some way towards... Yeah, right. yeah fill in that gap. Yeah. Um, so we've got one last question for you, which comes from our friend Fraser mm. Gregory on Twitter, and he'd like to know, uh, quarks or crotons? Hmm. 
Quarks or crotons? Ugh. I think quarks. I think the crotons. Are cute. <laughs> the crotons. Did you hear that, Fraser? Quarks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the quarks are kind of cool, aren't they, with those arms and the funny heads and stuff like that. The crotons are a bit embarrassing, and they're weird uh, South African <laughs> accents. Uh, although I think the crotons stand to, it's a slightly better story than the Dominators, uh, or we've got it in full, haven't we, the crotons, whereas we don't have all... Do we have all episodes of the Dominators? Yeah, we do. We, oh, no, we we've do, got we do, all yeah. the Dominators. It's, it's five episodes, mm. isn't it, whereas crotons is only four. Yeah, I, four, I, I, yeah. I go with quarks, definitely. They've got silly voices too. Anyway, it. Yes. I'm sure <laughs> Thank you, Fraser. Uh, <laughs> in, in response, yeah. I, th- I think Fraser will be very happy with that answer. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, Edward, it's been a real pleasure having you uh, on very our show so. today. Thank you for taking the time to, to do it and, um, you know, for sharing your stories and insight with us. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked for a couple of hours here and I think we could probably have gone on for, for longer. But, uh, you know, aware that, it's been uh, a pleasure. A, a like day to get back to and stuff. Yeah, I've not done this for a very long time, so it, it's been nice to talk about it. You know, <laughs> there, there were great times. I had a really <clears throat> fantastic time. Yeah. Uh, you know, like any job, it gets to a Monday morning, you don't necessarily want to go into work, um, and you have good days and bad days. But generally, my memories of it are, are really, really positive and uh, very happy. Yeah, you talk very life. fondly of it, which is clear. Yeah, definitely. definitely yeah. So, definitely. you know, as, as fans, thank you for, you know, everything there. You know, like I said earlier, all the things that you were involved in have, you know, entertained us all for, you know, over, over yeah, many, many years. And, and so. touched us in, in some way. So it's it's that connection, isn't it? We've all we've all been That's part nice of that and you. you've you've made That's it happen nice in so many ways. Yeah. Great. Thank you very and, much. And um okay. good luck with you know your script supervising and yeah. yes. directing plans and, and your short film as well and, Thank and everything you, yes. else that you're working Thank you. on. Yes, well maybe I'll get to show it your first brilliant. Well, I was I was going to plug it, but I thought oh, you know, I won't. So you've done it for me. <laughs> and and you so you'll know two of the judges then. So <laughs> fantastic, Edward Russell. Brilliant. Thank you so much for thank joining us, much. listeners. Thank you for listening and tuning in. And don't forget, there'll be more Who Corner to Corner coming your way very soon. So stay tuned. Thank you See for you listening. Bye for lot. now. <laughs> <laughs>